Hello everyone and all Hallows Eve. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you've been taking good care of yourselves. That you're not going to gorge yourselves on too much of that Halloween candy. But uh, I wouldn't blame you if you did. <laughs> but yes, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. We're here. We have uh, some ambiance going. We've got some tunage going. But yeah, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all taking good care of yourselves. Uh, welcome, welcome to the quarters for this All Hallows Eve, Samhain, and Halloween as it were. Uh, we're going to be reading some spooky stories tonight. We're going to be reading from a mix of uh, r slash no sleep and um, uh, creepypasta.com because classics. <laughs> we have a lot of really fun ones to go through, which I'm looking forward to. Oh, are those gobs cookies? Oh, that's cute. Oh, I see it. One's orange lock. And soul. You love to see it. You love to see it. <laughs> but yes, we're here. We're getting nice and cozy this holiday season. Hi, Les Bard. Hello. Um, we're getting nice and comfy. We're enjoying a little bit of the spooky ambiance. Uh, in a little bit, I will have to take a teeny step away from uh, stream to uh, go give some candy to some of my neighbor kids. Um, I'm eating the trick-or-treater candy because there aren't a bunch of kids today. Yeah, no, it's uh, our, our place doesn't get like a ton of kids either, uh, but there are two little ones that are going to be coming by and I want to make sure I can give them their grab bags because they're sweet kids and they deserve something nice for this Halloween. Um, I hope you guys enjoy my, uh, my rogue uh, costume. Uh, of course, due to everything, uh, I wasn't able to make a, uh, an actual outfit with uh, Tome and Putty. However, I think we did a pretty all right job. I think it turned out pretty good. <laughs> kind of a mishmash of old school rogue and new. So, we're going to be uh, kicking off with some uh, familiar stories to me, as well as a couple I haven't read before, but I did do a quick peruse to make sure I wouldn't get myself in trouble. Because uh, I definitely don't want to get in trouble uh, for for streaming the wrong thing, you know? Don't want to do that to myself. <laughs> yes. Like, happy Halloween, got myself cancelled. That wouldn't be great. Also, Blaze, thank you so much for the coin. Alright, so, we're going through some of uh, the top posts of both... Uh, creepypasta.com as well as r slash no sleep. I have definitely lost sleep reading from these uh, channels before, especially r slash no sleep, because it's so easy and convenient to read. Uh, by God, though, I have I have wasted so many hours of my night um, going through those stories. And later, I will be uh, joined by the wonderful Oscura CT, who will also be streaming uh, later this evening. I believe around 7, 7.30 or so. Uh, Caleb will be doing their own stream and we'll be able to see our, our lovely demonio uh, as we embark on more scary stories. So be sure to look out for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. But in the meantime, let's get started. Get yourselves cozy. This is from r slash no sleep by uh, T.Y. T-I-Y-A-F-W-O-N-S. Uh, this was written in May of 2012. Which tells you how long these uh, subreddits and whatnot have been around. <laughs> I've come to terms with the fact that everything I know is a dream. As a preface, please note that this will probably be very long. I don't care if nobody reads it. Everyone in the world could read it and nothing would change. I just need to voice my concerns for my own sake. Perhaps by organizing everything on a page, I can make sense of things. Several years ago, I was in a brutal car accident. I was parked in front of a train track, waiting for the train to pass by. I was the last person not to make it across the tracks. For visualization, there was a solid stream of cars on either side. If I had tried to sneak across, I would have rear-ended the person in front of me before successfully clearing them. I could hear the train approaching, and the black and yellow bars lowered in front of me. I'm fascinated by trains, so I was delighted to be so close, finally getting a front row seat. 
The train was about a quarter mile from the crossing when the driver behind me accelerated and nudged me forward a few feet. The bars bent and eventually snapped, and I was knocked joltingly onto the tracks. I panicked and threw the car into reverse, trying to back out. The other car apparently had more horsepower, however, and to my horror, my car door aligned perfectly with the cattle guard at the front of the train. I scrambled to get out of the car, but forgot about my seatbelt. I nearly strangled myself trying to get free. By the time I unlatched it, it was too late. One fraction of a second of the loudest sound I had ever heard, and then blackness. Silence. I was certain that I had died. I didn't feel any pain, and I certainly, if I had survived, I'd be in agony. I tried to open my eyes, but nothing would happen. I tried to make a sound, to wiggle my fingers, or do anything, but I couldn't. It wasn't that I was paralyzed, it was more like I didn't have a body to manipulate. I was just a mind submerged in a pool of nothing. The only sentiment I felt was that I had returned to that state after being gone for a too long time. Like forgetting how your parents' house smells until you visit home for the holidays. Gradually, I started to have feelings of sensation. Passing waves of warmth and wetness finally allowed me to determine where the edges of my body were. Almost as soon as I had become aware of my physical self, it began to ache. I felt as if every inch of me had been pummeled with a baseball bat, the heavy wooden kind. Even opening my eyes was a spectacular ordeal. I was in a hospital, so I had survived after all. People moved around to surround me. Faces that never fully came into focus hovered above my own, and sounds that vaguely resembled speech seemed to reach me through water. It wasn't long before I felt weak again and my eyes closed. This fading in and out of consciousness lasted for what felt like a very long time, maybe months, though the doctors told me it was only a matter of days. After that, I worked on speaking and swallowing food, which seemed silly, but it was actually a challenge at the time. Finally, as more and more casts were removed, I was allowed to sit up and turn my head, for which I was incredibly grateful. According to my family and my then-girlfriend Sarah, all of whom were overjoyed at being able to speak with me, I was asleep for several days on end after the crash. I remember Sarah specifically saying she had missed being able to stare at those beautiful eyes. Time passed at an excruciatingly slow pace until physical therapy finally escalated to the point where I could be pushed around in a wheelchair. The doctors were surprisingly hopeful that I'd be able to walk again, but it is what they called cautious optimism. Nobody wanted to tell me I could be independent again or, and then have to admit that they were wrong later. Obviously, I was very hopeful myself, though even transferring from chair to bed was a painful challenge. It was around this time that I noticed I never dreamed anymore. When I slept, I only felt the same nothingness that I felt immediately after the crash. All the days blended together for a while after that. The next memory I can actually separate from the rest is the first time I tried walking on my own. There were staff members holding onto my arms and waist, just in case I fell, and with their help, I made it all the way across the room on my first try. Doctors said they'd never seen such a rapid recovery. I was giddy. Obviously, I wasn't out of the woods yet. But soon, I was allowed to live at home again with frequent PT sessions. And some weeks after that, I returned to work. Life was almost normal for a while. Except for a very slight limp in my left leg, the side of the side that train hit me on, I was feeling pretty normal. It was only after a month of living in my own house that weird things started to happen. The first thing I noticed was that I felt an occasional stinging on my right forearm. Like a thin needle was puncturing my skin. It was a tiny prick, maybe twice a day at most. I figured it was just nerve trauma or something that um, blocked it from my mind. Fading ignorance was harder to do when I started hearing things, though. While I was reading in bed one night, I thought I heard Sarah crying. I strained my ears to make sure, and I definitely heard her sobs, but very distantly, like I was submerged in a pool. I made my way downstairs quickly, concerned that she'd hurt herself or something, but she was just washing dishes in the kitchen. Are you okay? I asked cautiously. Yeah, why? She asked nonchalantly. Uh, no reason. I dismissed these oddities as best I could. After all, how could anyone expect to recover from being hit by a goddamn train without some lingering effects? Every so often, mostly when I was trying to fall asleep or sitting in a silent room, 
I would hear occasional sounds that I couldn't connect at first. Gradually, I determined that they were hospital sounds. Stretchers being rolled across tiled floors, beeping from machines, rapid chatter between nurses and doctors. Although I figured anyone who had suffered as much trauma as I had would experience some degree of whatever I was experiencing, I decided to bring it up with my doctor. He told me it was perfectly normal for someone in my circumstances, and he would prescribe me some sleep aid if I felt it was necessary. I told him it wasn't a big deal. I was just satisfied that a doctor could explain my symptoms. The odd glimpses of what seemed to be my past only increased in frequency. When I slept, I finally dreamed again. But it was always the same thing. If I saw anything at all, it was a hospital room. Sometimes there were other people in the room, and sometimes I was alone with the machines. There was one night in particular in which the dream was more vivid and gripping than usual. My eyes opened wearily to see Sarah asleep on the chair beside my hospital bed. Sarah, I croaked. She jerked awake. Henry! She scrambled to my side, clutching my hand. At this point, it occurred to me that I was dreaming. I stared right into Sarah's eyes. I'm asleep right now. She seemed concerned. No, Henry, you're finally awake. I'm right here. It's been so long. Of course you would say that. You're part of my dream. I smiled, amused. I'll probably wake up any second. But as I spoke, the familiar soreness caught up with me all at once. It practically knocked the wind out of my lungs. Henry, no! Her distress was now evident. I don't know what you're talking about. Stay with me, Henry. Stay awake. Look at me. I'm glad that you enjoyed the hair. I'm glad you enjoyed the look. Hi, Crimson. <laughs> I shook my head defiantly and closed my eyes. When I opened them, I was back in my own bed. It was about three in the morning. I sat awake, pondering what I had just seen. I thought I heard Sarah crying again, even though I could see her sleeping beside me. When Sarah finally woke up, she rolled over and laid an arm across my chest. Good morning, big guy. She smiled groggily. If I was asleep right now, would you tell me? I asked. What? She chuckled. It's kind of heavy stuff to drop on a sleepy person. Just bear with me. If I was asleep right now, dreaming, you know, would you tell me? Mm, I feel pretty real, she noted, patting different parts of her body. You think I'm not real? Of course not, I said. We got ready for our day. I couldn't stop thinking about my dream, though. I noticed that when I tried really hard to space out at work and listen closely enough, I could hear the hospital sounds more clearly. I was naturally concerned about this. That night, I went to bed early, and just as I thought, I was transported immediately to the hospital bed. I felt the thin sheets beneath my fingers. I opened my eyes, and Sarah was reading a book in the same chair as before. I just looked at her lot for a long time, trying to discern if she was real. She certainly seemed real enough. She turned pages with the same flourish that she always had and chewed on one of the temples of her reading glasses. Eventually, she looked up and met my eyes. You're awake again! She gasped. Victoria! Paul! He's awake! My parents entered the room moments later, looking excited. I talked with them for a long time. Of course, my parents too denied the fact that I was asleep, but that topic passed quickly. Instead, we discussed my condition. I'd been in a coma for almost three months with little response. They'd been slowly losing hope for my recovery until my brain showed signs of activity. Since that time, they'd been visiting me frequently. Oop, been inverted. <laughs> I am now mega rogue. <laughs> Since that time, they'd been visiting me frequently, hoping that I would wake up. It seemed a pretty convincing story. After many hours of talking, I had to stop. I was legitimately sleepy. Of course, they all understood and I fell back asleep. Only this time, I didn't wake up in my own bed. I woke up in the same hospital bed a few hours later. I had to think about it for a very long time, but eventually concluded that I must have imagined my miraculous recovery and had been in a coma the whole time after all. As you can imagine, it was hard to explain. Since then, I've been making a second recovery, which has been slower and less successful than the first. That's why, for a long time, I was mostly convinced that I'm really awake this time. 
Nobody walks after getting blindsided by a train. At least, not without lots of hard work. I have still only left my wheelchair on crutches, and it's been six years. It probably sounds like a bittersweet ending, and at one point I agreed. I was prepared to live happily ever after in my wheelchair, and maybe even graduate to crutches someday, except for one thing. When I'm getting ready for bed, after I turn off my lamp and my head hits the pillow, I can still hear them. The faint sounds of a busy hospital. I know that many of you will say, but I'm real. This is real life. Of course you're awake. But that's what you're supposed to say. Nobody's going to tell me. I'm fake. You're dreaming. Wake up. I'm still asleep. And I've learned to deal with it. I know that nobody I meet during the day is real, but I'm tired. So I just pretend. And that will have to do. I remember the first time reading this story and being like, kind of super creeped out about it because like the idea of one you know naturally just dealing with like that whole concept is terrifying but also just having just the worst case of that you know like oh that, that sounds so nightmarish oh weird so fun fact um if you uh <laughs> if you minimize creepypasta's sight just enough uh, the page goes white instead of black, and you can't actually read the stories because the font is white. <laughs> That's fucking silly. Yeah, exactly. The amount of times that people have been like, as a prank, go up to people and go like, Hey, you're still dreaming. Wake up. It's like, fuck off. Also, hi, Scribs. Yes, we are We are doing scary story reading tonight. Um, and yes, happy Hallow's Eve. Happy Halloween, everybody. All the messages about the truth. Yes. Um, but yes, uh, in a little bit, actually, probably in the next hour or so, um, I will be giving candy to my neighbor kids, as well as getting into call with Caleb, aka Oscuros VT, to, uh, to continue doing some more sp scary readings. I've actually given Caleb a couple scary stories as a recommendation, so I will be avoiding reading those while he's not here. Because, uh, there's certain ones that I'm just like, ooh, I think you do a really good job reading this. Actually, there's also another scary book that I have that's quite fun. Can I find it? Let's find out. I've also given Caleb a couple of, uh, I gave Caleb a story from this collection of stories that I've had for a very long time. Um, it is, I have a physical copy of this book because I am a very big fan of Tim Burton and, uh, the things that he creates and all that stuff that's in his fun little mind. So, uh, one of the things that I have is The Melancholy Death of Oyster Boy and Other Stories by Tim Burton. Uh, if you can get your hands on this actual book, I highly recommend it, because it comes with some very cute little illustrations and whatnot to go along with it, that I absolutely love. Uh, I do apologize as well if you hear me sniffling or anything like that, or if you hear coughing in the background. Uh, the Candyman and I are currently getting over a cold, and um, we're both only just starting to feel better. Um, those that were in stream yesterday, over on the Blue Heart site, you'll know that I ended the stream literally in a massive coughing fit. It was not fun. <laughs> so? I'll actually read one of the uh, stories from The Melancholy Death of Oyster Boy and Other Stories by Tim Burton. And all of these stories are incredibly short. They're usually only like a couple pages long at best. And then Data came out of her little house. Hi, Data. So this is the story called Sue. To avoid a lawsuit, we'll just call her Sue. 
or that girl who likes to sniff lots of glue. The reason I know that this is the case is when she blows her nose. Who next sticks to her face? <laughs> and all the illustrations have been done by Tim Burton, and they're all very, very fun. They're done with like that in watercolor. So let's read Anchor Baby. There was a beautiful girl who came from the sea, and there was just one place that she wanted to be. With a man named Walker who played in a band, she would leave the ocean and come onto the land. He was the one she wanted the most, and she tried everything to capture his ghost. But throughout all their lives, they never connected. She wandered the earth, alone and rejected. She tried looking happy, she tried looking tragic, tried astral, astral projecting, sex, and black magic. Nothing could join them, except maybe one thing, just maybe something to anchor their spirits. They had a baby. But to give birth to the baby, they needed a crane. The umbilical cord was in the form of a chain. It was ugly and gloomy and as hard as a kettle. It had no pink skin, just heavy gray metal. The baby that was meant to bring them together just shrouded them both in a cloud of foul weather. So Walker took off to play with the band, and from that day on, he stayed mainly on land. And she was alone with her grey baby anchor, who got so oppressive that it eventually sank her. As she went to the bottom, not fulfilling her wish, it was her and her baby and a few scattered fish. Paige, thank you so much for the resub, love. I'm so sorry you're still awake. <laughs> I hope you're doing okay. Maybe some spooky stories will lull you to sleep. Alright. Because you're struggling to sleep. Totally fair. All right, now back to the online stories. This one is another popular one. More than likely you've heard more than a few people read this one. Also, thank you. Had to do the rouge, uh, had, had to do uh, the rogue hair. It was gonna be too much fun not to. <laughs> Especially with this new hairstyle, it lends itself to it quite nicely. So fun fact, this story was actually written on my birthday. Uh, not the same year, but the same day. October 25th, 2010. This is Mr. Widemouth. During my childhood, my family was like a drop of water in a vast river, never remaining in one location for long. We settled in Rhode Island when I was eight, and, the, and there we remained until I went to college in Colorado Springs. Most of my memories are rooted in Rhode Island, but there are fragments in the attic of my brain which belong to the various homes we had lived in when I was much younger. Most of these memories are unclear and pointless. Chasing after another boy in the backyard of a house in North Carolina, trying to build a raft to float on the creek behind the apartment we rented in Pennsylvania, and so on. I gotta just add a little bit. There we go. Also, hi, May. How you doing? Happy spooky day. But there is one set of memories which remains as clear as glass as though they were just made yesterday. I often wonder whether these memories are simply lucid dreams produced by the long sickness I experienced that spring, but in my heart, I know they are real. We were living in a house just outside the bustling metropolis of New Vineyard, Maine, population 643. It was a large structure, especially for a family of three. There were a number of rooms that I didn't see in the five months we resided there. In some ways, it was a waste of space, but it was the only house on the market at the time, at least within the hour's commute to my father's place of work. The day after my fifth birthday, attended by my parents alone, I came down with a fever. The doctor said I had mon mononucleosis, which meant no rough play and more fever for at least another three weeks. It was horrible timing to be bedridden. We were in the process of packing our things to move to Pennsylvania, and most of my things were already packed away in boxes, leaving my room barren. My mother brought me ginger ale and books several times a day, 
and these served a function of being my primary form of entertainment for the next few weeks. Boredom always loomed just around the corner, waiting to rear its ugly head and compound my misery. I don't exactly recall how I met Mr. Widemouth. I think it was about a week after I was diagnosed with mono. My first memory of the small creature was asking him if he had a name. He told me to call him Mr. Widemouth, because his mouth was so large. In fact, everything about him was large in comparison to his body. His head, his eyes, his crooked ears. But his mouth was by far the largest. You look kind of like a Furby, I said as he flipped through one of my books. Mr. Widemouth stopped and gave me a puzzled look. Furby? What's a Furby? He asked. I shrugged. You know, the toy. The little robot with the big ears. You can pet him and feed him, almost like a real pet. Oh. Mr. Widemouth resumed his activity. You don't need one of those. They aren't the same as having real friends. I remember Mr. Widemouth disappearing every time my mother stopped by to check in on me. I lay under your bed, he later explained. I don't want your parents to see me because I'm afraid they won't let us play anymore. We didn't do much during those first few days. Mr. Widemouth just looked at my books, fascinated by the stories and pictures they contained. The third and fourth morning after I met him, he greeted me with a large smile on his face. I have a new game we can play, he said. We have to wait until your mother comes to check on you, because she can't see us play it. It's a secret game. After my mother delivered some bo more books and soda at the usual time, Mr. Widemouth slipped out from under the bed and tugged my hand. We have to go to the room at the end of the hallway, he said. I objected at first, as my parents had forbidden me to leave my bed without their permission, but Mr. Widemouth persisted until I gave in. The room in question had no furniture or wallpaper. Its only distinguishing feature was a window opposite the doorway. Mr. Widemouth darted across the room and gave the window a firm push, flinging it open. He then beckoned me to look out at the ground below. We were on the second story of the house, but it was on a hill, and from this angle the drop was farther than two stories due to the incline. I like to play pretend up here, Mr. Widemouth explained. I pretend that there's a big soft trampoline below this window, and I jump. If we pretend if you pretend hard enough, you bounce back up like a feather. I want you to try. I was a five year old with a fever, so only a hint of skepticism darted through my thoughts as I looked down and considered the possibility. It's a long drop. I said. But that's all part of the fun. It wouldn't work if it was only a short drop. If it were that way, you may as well just bounce on a real trampoline. I toyed with the idea, picturing myself falling through thin air only to bounce back to the window on some un something unseen by the human eyes. But the realist in me prevailed. Maybe some other time, I said. I don't know if I have enough imagination. I could get hurt. Mr. Widemouth's face contorted into a snarl, but only for a moment. Anger gave way to disappointment. If you say so, he said. He spent the rest of the day under my bed, quiet as a mouse. The following morning, Mr. Widemouth arrived holding a small box. I want to teach you how to juggle, he said. Here's some things you can use to practice before I start giving you lessons. I looked in the box. It was full of knives. My parents will kill me, I shouted, horrified that Mr. Widemouth had brought knives into my room. Objects that my parents would never allow me to touch. I'll be spanked and grounded for a year. Mr. Widemouth frowned. It's fun to juggle with these. I want you to try it. I pushed the box away. I can't. I'll get in trouble. Knives aren't safe to just throw in the air. Mr. Widemouth's frown deepened into a scowl. He took the box of knives and slid under my bed, remaining there for the rest of the day. I began to wonder how often he was under me. I started having trouble sleeping after that. Mr. Widemouth often woke me up at night, saying he put a real trampoline under the window, a big one, one that I couldn't see in the dark. I always declined and tried to go back to sleep, but Mr. Widemouth persisted. Sometimes he stayed by my side until early in the morning, encouraging me to jump. He wasn't so fun to play with anymore. My mother came to me one morning and told me I had her permission to walk around outside. She thought the fresh air would do me good, especially after being confined to my room for so long. Ecstatic, I put on my sneakers and trotted out to the back porch, yearning for the feeling of the sun on my face. Mr. Widemouth was waiting for me. I have something I want you to see, he said. I must have given him a weird look because he then said, It's safe, I promise. I followed him to the beginning of the deer trail which ran through the woods behind the house. This is an important path, he explained. 
I've had lots of friends about your age. Then they were ready. I took them down this path to a special place. You aren't ready yet, but one day I hope to take you there. I returned to the house, wondering what kind of place lay beyond the trail. Two weeks after I met Mr. Widemouth, the last load of our things had been packed into the moving truck. I would be in the cab of that truck, sitting next to my pop father for the long drive to Pennsylvania. I considered telling Mr. Widemouth that I would be leaving, but even at five years old, I was beginning to suspect that perhaps the creature's intentions were not to my benefit, despite what he said otherwise. For this reason, I decided to keep my departure a secret. My father and I were in the truck at 4 a.m. He was hoping to make it to Pennsylvania by lunchtime tomorrow with the help of the endless supply of coffee and a six-pack of energy drinks. He seemed more like a man who was about to run a marathon rather than one who was about to spend two days sitting still. Early enough for you? He asked. I nodded and placed my head against the window, hoping for some sleep before the sun came up. I felt my father's hand on my shoulder. This is the last move, son. I promise. I know it's hard for you, and as sick as you've been. Once Daddy gets promoted, we can settle down and you can make new friends. I opened my eyes as we backed out of the driveway. I saw Mr. Widemouth's silhouette in my bedroom window. He stood motionless until the truck was about to turn on the main road. He gave a pitiful little wave goodbye, steak knife in hand. I didn't wave back. Years later, I returned to New Vineyard. The piece of land our house stood upon was empty except for the foundation, as the house burned down a few years after my family left. Out of curiosity, I followed the deer trail that Mr. Widemouth had shown me. Part of me expected him to jump out from behind a tree and scare the living bejesus out of me, but I felt that Mr. Widemouth was gone, somehow tied to the house that no longer existed. The trail ended at the New Vineyard Memorial Cemetery. I noticed that many of the tombstones belonged to children. So credit to Perfect Circle 35 uh, for this. This is a, a classic one for the early days of spoopy stories. <laughs> Question of the day, what's your favorite Halloween candy? Ooh, uh, lemon lollipops? Or those Werther's Originals, the single wrapped ones? Fucking love those. Those are so good. But yeah, I, I was always the kid that liked the lemon candies, and I liked lemon lollipops, even though everybody else in my class didn't like them. So they were my favorite, and it meant I always got them. <laughs> cool. How about you, chat? What's your favorite candy? Do we have any people that are big fans of the candied corn? <laughs> Hi, Dante. You love Kit Kats? Nice, nice. Have you read the Taily Post story? I have not. I don't think I recognize that name. I'm going to look it up. Ooh, dime bars are good. You mean mini candles? <laughs> I will admit they do taste super waxy. Oh, it's an Appalachian tale. Interesting, interesting. Uh, is it a chilling retelling of the Appalachian legends, uh, Old Old Tales Press? I have it pulled up. I'm down to read it. If you if you suggest it, I, I'm willing to read it. <laughs> good butterscotch is good. <laughs> I like my old people candy. <laughs> no, it's also super cool. A raid! Comic! Thank you so much for joining us and hello to the Raiders. I'm Marina the Mouse, a variety streamer here on Twitch. I do a variety of things, usually poorly, but I usually do well singing and or drinking. I'm currently doing it while reading. We've got some spooky stories tonight. We have read through uh, Mr. Widemouth. Um, I've come to terms that I'm in a dream. And a couple of tales from the melancholy death of Oyster Boy. 
I hope you had a great time, uh, comic. And if you came in from a raid, do make sure that you're taking care of yourselves. Eat something, drink something, take your meds and put on your chapstick. Patronage is appreciated, but your health is appreciated more. Okay, perfect. I have it pulled up. Uh, I actually have it right here, so I can, uh, I, I can give that a read as well. <laughs> oh yeah, those little strawberry candies with, like, the little strawberry wrappers. <laughs> I remember those. Fuck. Um, I don't- I never know where grandparents get those, but I see them in every grandparent's house. <laughs> I don't know how. But yeah, welcome! It's Halloween! We're doing some scary readings. Um, do note that, uh, I will have to take a teeny weeny break, uh, in a little while to go give candy to my neighbor kids, as well as to, uh, set up with Caleb when Caleb is ready to go, because we're gonna be joining each other for some spooky stories. It's gonna be great. Um, I actually gave Caleb a couple stories to read, uh, as well. Because I absolutely love uh, a good scary story. And I'm a big fan of r slash no sleep and creepypasta. <laughs> I read way too much of that as a kid. <laughs> also, thank you for placing the milk bottle. I am the Milk Mouse Maiden and my milk is indeed delicious. Don't worry about the raid and run. Go take care of yourself. Have a wonderful Halloween and I'm glad that you came by. Alright. Uh... We're gonna we're gonna read the suggestion from uh, Blood Vomit here. Uh, I am still sniffly, and I am still a bit sick, so I do apologize uh, if I am uh, a little bit gumped up while I'm doing my readings, or if you hear sniffling, or if you hear coughing in the background, because Candy is also sick. Because oops. <laughs> uh. But I'm feeling better than I was. I'm feeling much better than I was. In fact, uh, I'm already, like, I, I don't feel as worn out as I did yesterday, which is good. So we are going to read, uh, this is a suggestion from Blood Vomit. Uh, Telepo, a chilling retelling of the Appalachian legend. A ghost story for Halloween. This was posted onto oldstyletales.com. Also, I appreciate people who put down how long it roughly takes to read something. My god, more reading sites need to do that, please. In the midst of a starving winter, a cocksure hunter ignores his neighbor's advice to come down from his lonely cabin in Jawbone Ridge. They avoid the sinister area during the savage winters, but he savors its isolation. But when he and his three hounds are unexpectedly trapped there in a blizzard, he grows desperate for food and doesn't hesitate to chop off the long tail of a bizarre cat-like creature he catches in the woods. But the animal wants its tail back, and the deep gouges it has clawed into the door from the beginning to, are beginning to concern him, especially because the creature knows exactly where to find its beloved Telepo. Have sirens. Oh my goodness, it is... I just... Sorry. I just looked outside. It is raining. Like, crazy out there. Like, it's not super heavy, but there's a lot of it, and there's wind. So I just looked outside. I'm like, huh, it seems mistier than usual. It's like, no, that's rain. That's all just rain. Oh my god. Everyone stay safe out there. It's terrible what they say happened to old Jack Grier. Terrible, but we can't really say that he should have been surprised. Living alone up there on the mountain during the dead of winter, it was a fool's errand and we all told him as much. The mountain is a strange place, especially when the weather takes a turn. None of us ever hunt up there alone or for any longer than three days. But Jack was strange in the head. A loner, a rebel. Self-sufficient, he said. Independent, he said. But the old women in town called him a damn fool when they found him after the thaw and what he had been cooking and eating on the night that it happened well it proved them right see old jack didn't like society and he spent nearly all of his time in the cabin his great grandpappy built on the leewa side leeward side of the ridge under the shadows of the flint wall where the snow piles into wispy tufts that look like pointed teeth in a lower jaw that's why it's called Jawbone Ridge, if you hadn't guessed. Most of us hunt in the summertime for sport and in the fall to feed our young ones, but we stay home during the winter. The ridge is treacherous once November starts brewing. If you get caught up there when the weather turns, it probably won't go well for you. 
The whole east side of the mountain is a graveyard holding the bones of dozens of men who dallied up there alone, and even a few who went up there in parties and tried to play it smart. It's like the sea, vast and merciless, and not giving up her dead, as the preachers say, until the resurrection. There's some who even doubt that the Lord will be able to pry those corpses out of the mountain's jealous grip. And so when October came, we went out in hunting parties. Brought back deer and hares and possums and coons, and our women folk skinned them and dried them in the smokers so that we could have meat over the long winter. And old Jack Ryer went up there too. But he didn't go with his just a gun and a haversack. He filled up his big wooden barrow with supplies. He had his three hounds at his heels, and a big bulging knapsack weighing him down. His gun was slung over one arm, and his axe was tucked under the other. And we saw he had parts of first. We saw he had parts for a still hidden under the tarp covering his barrow. Well enough, his great grandpappy built that cabin as a moonshining base. He was covered in furs, even though it was warm, uh, even though it was a warm October afternoon. And that's how we knew he meant to stay there well into winter maybe longer. He didn't say a word to any of us as we went up the trails and split off on our separate way. Johnny Aberdeen was the last to see him, lugging his barrow into the hills, the three dogs close behind, and the sun sinking into the shadows. Old Betty McAllister was has a witching touch, they say. She's not gone over to the darkness, we don't think, but when her grandmammy came over the hills from the old country, our great-great-grandparents heard her, that her grandmammy, Betty's great-great-grandmammy, had been strung up for a witch. Well, she goes to Sunday meeting, and she says the Lord's Prayer and says it well, but she has a touch of the uncouth about her. Some say she has the second sight. She's old as dust indeed, and remembers all the lore of the mountain. And when she dreamed about old Jack Cryer that third week of December, I a month after the big blizzard's notice off the, from the valley, he knew something had happened. And when the snows thawed the week after Epiphany, we sent a party of men to find him. When they found him, we remembered what old Betty McAllister dreamed. The hunters returned with hares and coons and some does and buck. But old Jack stayed where he was. Johnny Aberdeen says he'd seen smoke coming from the lee side under Jawbone Ridge, and we knew old Jack was fixing to stay up there for a while. But for a brief moment, we're going to pause because we just received a raid. Hello, Link! Hello to the raiders. I'm Raiden the Mouse. I'm a variety streamer here on Twitch. I do variety things usually poorly, but I usually do while singing it or drinking. I'm currently doing it while reading some scary stories for All Hallows' Eve. If you came in from the raid, do make sure you're taking care of yourself. Eat something, drink something, take your beds, and put on your chapstick. Patronage is appreciated, but your health is appreciated far more. I hope you had yourselves a good time over at Link's side. I know I would. And you're playing some Pikmin too. I hope you had a good time and I hope you've been having a very fun Halloween so far. If you don't celebrate, I hope you've just been enjoying the copious amount of discount candy. <laughs> We're currently reading through some stories. Oh, fair enough. Uh, we're currently reading the Telepo. Uh, in a little bit, I will be joined by uh, Caleb, aka Oscurus VT, um, and I will also be handing out some candy to some of the local kids in my building. All that good stuff. Enjoy your link. Uh, enjoy your link. Enjoy your link, Lurk. <laughs> enjoy your Lurk link. And I hope you enjoy uh, your break. If you need to go take care of yourself, please do. Braid front is totally fine. <laughs> also, apologies if you hear me stuffling. We're sounding kind of gunky. Uh, I am still recovering from a cold. Um, we knew old Jack was fixing to stay up there for a while. Halloween came and passed and old Jack stayed put. The election day came, but Jack didn't come down from the hills to vote. Thanksgiving came and the hunters went out to fetch turkeys for the th from the thickets. And they said they saw the smoke coming up from the curls of Jawbone Ridge. Still alive, still staying put. But the day after Thanksgiving, the weather shifted. The clouds were an off color, grayish green, dark with snow. Betty figures that Jack was stuck in his cabin up there under the ridge, even though he had the lee. She tells us he was expecting bad weather so it didn't trouble him. But she also says that his food ran out by the second week of the advent, and when she told us the rest, we knew he was dead. 
snowed in with his dogs he was. He could force his way out about a quarter mile if he absolutely had to, but it was risky moving about in the snow with the wind shifting the banks and knocking over trees without warning, so he mostly stayed put. There weren't any deer to be found or coons to be grabbed. He was just there with three dogs, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The dogs were his kin, as far as he was concerned, and he was looking out for food for them as much as himself, bringing in a few squirrels at first, then catching some mice in the house, then boiling roots and walnuts for broth. It was out of the question to put the hounds to the axe. The time was running out for all four of them. It was a few days since they'd had a bite, just melted snow to drink, when they, we think he first saw it. It was the most curious critter he'd ever laid eyes on, just scuffling in the shadows at the far side of the cabin, chasing some beetle or moth as, it had, as if it had been the only creature in the room. The hounds watched it warily, because it was so foreign to them too, and had the look of a queer bogey. It was black all over and half the size of any of the hounds. Something like a cat. It looked like a cat, too, with pointed, tufted ears and great golden eyes that flashed green in the shadows. But it wasn't quite a cat. Not like the one that old Betty keeps and has been keeping on for nigh on 20 years. A strange, unaging tomcat it is, too. Because its paws were clumsy and large, the size of apples, and it flourished a great shaggy tail, black as coal and twice the length of its spine. The creature pounced on the moth or beetle, and delighted at the sight of its victory. With a casual glance, it finally looked over at Old Jack. Old Jack saw its eyes, wide and glowing like two embers smoldering in a hearth, blinked twice at him before it turned back to the crushed insect under its ungainly paw. Old Jack reached over for his gun. He handled it gently, and with the slowest movements he ever did see, without even standing up from his chair, he held the stock against his shoulder and leveled the tube at the bogey. He rested his thumb on the hammer and slowly pulled it back with a hollow steel click. The bogey's eyes suddenly rose with a jerk. They were staring right at him. Jack tilted the barrel so that it was pointed directly between the eyes, and then he pulled the trigger tight with a sudden jerk. The cap snapped and a whiff of powder stung his nostrils. The main charge hadn't gone off. He sat there, hanging fire, till he realized that the powder had probably been ruined by the snow while he was foraging that morning. He set the rifle down. His axe was leaning against the woodpile at his elbow. The two eyes watched him unblinkingly. They blazed with fear and wonder. Old Jack was losing patience, we figure, because now he didn't take it slow. He grabbed that axe by the very end of the hickory handle and swung out at the two eyes like he was holding a saber. The bogey jumped into action, racing up the wall, along the ceiling, and down the other side, along the floor, scrambling wildly like a salamander, scuttling nimbly as he dodged Jack's frantic blows. The hounds backed off and watched with wide eyes. The creature was on the floor, running madly for the fireplace. A clump of pine brands was snapping with large, uh, was snapping with large white and blue flames, but it didn't seem to care. It was making a mad dash for the chimney, and then it was among the fire and threw it going up. And old Jack knew it was now or never, and by God, he swung out. The bogey rushed up the chimney, but its long black tail had been severed at the base and was tumbling into the fire. None of it could be wasted, so he reached into the flames and recovered the bogey's tail. Compared to roots and nuts, the prospect of boiling the tail into a broth must have seemed like a feast, though he quickly melted a kettle of snow, skinned the member, and boiled away the meat and sinew. There were a few dried herbs left in his haversack, a couple of bay leaves and a few sprigs of rosemary. He added these to the brew along with some snips from wild garlic he'd found growing in the dirt floor by the door. It rendered an oily, pungent broth that filled the cabin with a greasy steam. He greedily slurped down half the soup, chewing the bones into pulp and sucking out the marrow. He gave the rest to the dogs, who sniffed it, but they refused to even try it. He finished what was left, and as the wind pounded its way across the jawbone ridge ahead, overhead, he was thankful to be on the lee side where he was safe and warm, and now, finally full. The fire guttered as the wind moaned across the chimney top, scattering red sparks in the fireplace like flakes in a snow globe. He doused the lantern, leaving only the molten glare of the three smoldering logs in the fireplace, and climbed the ladder to the loft which made up his bedroom. He had created a very comfortable bed there out of bear skins and beaver pelts piled on top of a bed of fresh hay that he changed every couple of months. He slept on top of his on top of this under two camp blankets that he had from his stint in the army and a quilt that his grandmammy had made to keep her kids warm on the boat over the Ulster during the Great Famine. It was as warm as he could hope for. 
His belly was heavy with the soup, and even though he hadn't been able to have any bread or potatoes with it, he felt full, and the flavor hadn't been bad either. Rather like a pork trimming stew, he listened to the fire snap below and he fell asleep. I'm bored! Thank you so much for joining the crew. Grab yourself a pint, have a seat, and join the Sea of Misadventure. Uh, our ad is going to be starting in roughly five minutes, uh, so do make sure to keep that in mind. Uh, the ad will be about three minutes long, so take that opportunity to rest up, get yourself a snack, some sippy, stretch your legs, use the bathroom, put on your chapstick, all that good stuff. Or, uh, hey, if you feel like it, maybe subscribe. That'd be pretty cool, but you don't have to if you don't want to. I get you. <laughs> when he woke up, it was because of the angry scratching at the door. The embers had died to a white ash, with only a few lingering eyes glaring up at him from the grate. He sat for a spell, listening to the noise. It was intentional, all right, like the sound of a dog shut up in a room, trying to force the door open with a combination of his claws and throwing his entire heft against the door. But somehow it sounded smaller. No, it wasn't a dog at all. And where were his dogs? There, there in the corner, bristling and shaking and staring at the rattling door. Old Jack Grier wasn't afraid of the rabid coon or a hungry cat, or even that queer bogey whose tail had just filled his belly with warm comfort. He reached for his rifle, but remembered the spoiled powder. He'd have to draw the charge eventually, but in the meantime, he grabbed the axe. It still had a brown smear up the middle from the blade from where the tail had been severed. He gripped it by the middle of the handle and threw open the door. It was there. Just a howling black gulf unbrightened by stars or moon. The only light came from the oil lantern in his left hand, which threw a severe red glare of the dust on the dusty snow shifting from bank to bank outside his door. There were prints in the snow near his feet. Large, awkward paw prints, strangely close together, resembling the marks of a house cat but heavier, almost wolf-like in their heft. He walked around the door, holding the axe even tighter. The outside planks had been lacerated viciously. The old gray weather-beaten skin was stripped from the deep yellow gashes, up and down, crisscrossing, webbing wildly, as if in some desperate person with a straight razor had been trying to slash away his way inside. Long gray corkscrew peels of wood lay in front of the door like the cast-offs from a carpenter's shop. As he stared down at the ravaged wood, he heard a frantic clatter and glanced over his shoulder just in time to see the three hounds, their bodies freckled with lamplight, barging through the door and down the path into the deadly snow. They had stayed with him through harsher starving times, had saved him from attacks of two bears, three wolves, and a bobcat. They were scored and gnar with gnarled white scars from their combats and were disciplined from age, experience, and hardship. And yet they ran, away from him, away from the kettle that stank the bogey's tail stew, away from the lacerated door. And while old Jack Grier stared after them, into the formless blackness that closed in around the defensive light of his lamp, he heard something. At first, he thought it was the flight of some ghastly, heavy insect, or the unseasonable, unseasonal groan of a cicada, or the rasp of a door on its hinges. It was a voice, however. A horrible, horrible voice. Harsh, gargled, inhuman, simultaneously hoarse and deep, frail and raspy, like that of a bitter old woman or a sleepy young boy. It growled at him from somewhere overhead. Telepo! Tailypo, you've got my tailypo. The word meant nothing to Jack Grier, other than the vague allusion to a tail coupled with a childish sense of endear fond endearment. Looking into the trees above, he thought he caught a glimpse of two green cinders blazing in the dark, but in the wink, they were gone. He quickly went inside with his axe and his lamp and closed the door tightly. He barred it with shaking hands and instantly went to his rifle and nervously began to take it apart. He turned the knob on the lamp, raising the wick and casting more light around the dusty cabin, a ghostly green-white light that threw heavy brown shadows. Out came the barrel, away from the stock, and there in the breach was the wet charge of powder like a lump of clay. He cast it into the fire where the sulfur sizzled and released brown smoke. He had just slid the barrel back into place and clamped it tight when he heard a faint, playful scratch on the door. His heart seemed to stop. There was his ammunition bag off the side with its dry paper cartridges and the chance to defend himself. The scratching suddenly picked up tempo and volume, 
clattering in his ears while the door rattled against the jams. He grabbed a dry cartridge, bit the end off, and poured the powder down the barrel, then the creased bullet, and he rammed them home, the metallic jangle of the ramrod responding to the heavy pound of the shuddering door. And as he fumbled to apply the cap to his gun lock, he heard, muffled but strong, the same raspy moan. Taily po, taily po, you've got my taily po. Without a second thought, he aimed at the spot in the door where a few thin streaks of black night were showing through the savaged wood and pulled the trigger. The charge exploded smartly and the ball punched through the wood and into the night. The door stopped jostling. There was no voice on the other side. He waited for a response, but none came. He stared at the door for what seemed like a quarter of an hour. Nothing happened. Old Jack was a good hunter with strong nerves, but he had never wanted to be in town right now as much as he did in this moment. He settled the gun against the wall and wearily trudged up the ladder to his loft. He laid down the pelts and pulled the blankets up to his jaw. He fell asleep almost immediately, but was troubled by the dreams of toothless witches and grinning goblins and skeletons jiggling in the graveyards. We're gonna take a little break because we currently got the ad going. And uh, I just received a message from our lovely Oscurus. So I will see you guys in just a few minutes. Enjoy some Electro Swing and hoping you're having yourselves a wonderful Halloween so far. See you in a moment. So I'm going to wrap up the story that we're currently reading, and then we're going to join the wonderful Caleb, a.k.a. Oscurus VT. If you guys haven't followed Caleb before, Caleb does regular reading content and absolutely nails it every time. So I highly recommend going and giving them a good look. Uh, if you haven't already, please go and, go and love on them. They're absolutely lovely. Mi demonio is very sweet. Um, querido demonio. But as we, we will wrap up the Taily Poe, uh, story 
Um, it's a bit more longer of a read than it said it was going to be, but we'll, we will figure it out. He was woken up by the crash of wood. At first, he thought it was a ghoul breaking through the top of a coffin to gorge on the gray flesh hidden beneath. But then he looked up and realized where he was and that the door had been successfully breached. Perhaps the bogey had been clawing at it for hours, or perhaps it had just flung its tiny body at the gouged boards a few times before one gave way. He reached out to his side. There was no rifle. It was downstairs. There was no razor-sharp axe. It was on the woodpile. There was no hunting knife. It was with his ammunition bag. He gripped at the quilt desperately. He had left the oil lamp burning, apparently, because a ghostly light of the color of spoiled cream was faintly lapping at the wall opposite him, and the latter stood silhouetted against it, black and stark like the iron rail of a cemetery. The light was pale and weak, but he could detect shadows moving around it, as if something were walking around the room below him, searching. He thought to himself that the bogey would probably not be able to climb the ladder, and for a moment, he felt safe. He had to bite his tongue to keep from crying out, however, when he saw something black and cat-like climbing up the cabin wall with the speed and comfort of a salamander. Its hefty paws splayed like starfish, its head wheeling about from side to side like a blind man's cane. Its hindquarters supported with about three inches of tail, a stump that was gruesomely twitching back and forth from what Jack imagined must be excitement of anticipation or the thrill of revenge. And then the knobby head swiveled like an owl's, and Jack found himself staring into its molten green gaze. Quick as a flash, its jaws opened, its mouth with purplish red with long yellow teeth, and a voice seemed to roll from its throat. Telepo, telepo, you've got my telepo. But I don't have it, Jack moaned. It's gone, all gone, it's eaten, you can't have her back. The bogey slithered frantically up the wall to the ceiling, across the ceiling until it was over the loft, and then it let go and fell to the floor in front of Jack's bed. There was a pregnant moment of anticipation, and then he saw two pointed, tufted black ears slowly rise between his feet, followed by a furry round head and two gleaming green eyes. I done told you, Jack pleaded. I ain't got it no more. I ain't got your tailypo. It's all gone. Boiled to soup and ate. I'm sorry. I don't got it. The eyes didn't blink. The head tilted curiously until it was almost perpendicular to its body, watching old Jack sideways. Its purple tongue lolled out of its mouth and its eyes sparkled. Tailypo, tailypo, you've got my tailypo. But I just told you. I don't. Something seemed to click in Jack Grier's brain. The bogey was a loner, like him. A rebel, too. A stubborn, independent, self-reliant survivor. And he was also just as vindictive and just as unforgiving. It took just a moment for the grinning face to disappear under the blankets. Jack felt it slither towards him. Felt its soft fur rub along his inner legs. Felt its front paws pressing into his groin, onto his gut, and steady themselves just below his ribcage. It was purring, and he loathed the vibrations that rumbled from beneath the blanket, just as he loathed the wetness that was spreading down his pants and the girlish pleas that exploded from his throat as the bogey's talons shot through his abdomen and slit him open with a single quick stroke. And again, and again, and again, and again, through the belly to the spine, then to the throat, and down, down, down to the pelvis, and under the ribs to the lungs, to the heart to the stomach. Its fur was heavy with gore, its mouth was dripping and red, and with one casual slice, it ripped open the stomach to ribbons, just as you would slice open the plastic wrap on a chicken breast with a flick of steak knife. And the black bile and blood soaked the blankets and spilled to the floor and dripped to the ground. We followed old Betty's vision faithfully, and we found that most of what she'd said was true. We found the three dogs, mad with fear, at the house of a farmer in the valley. He fed them when they came down the mountain, but he says he doesn't think they'll ever be good hunting dogs again. He wondered at that when we saw their scars from bears and wolves, and says they must have had a terrible shock. We found the cabin with its door gouged and sliced to ribbons. A hole the size of a man's head had been punched through the center of the mutilations, and we had to break it in with axes because it was barred from the inside. 
We found a bullet hole in the door near the gash and, spent, and a spent cartridge on the floor. The lamp was burned dry at the table and the axe near the fireplace was dark with bloodstains. There was the man himself in his bed, stone dead, face white as paper, plotted with putrid gore, ripped open from gullet to groin. We still talk about old Jack Grier and the terrible thing that was done to him for four years four years ago when the blizzard caught him unawares, and he was stuck on the mountain on Jawbone Ridge with the thing that opened him up like a fish. We don't know if old Betty's dream is all true, but young Johnny Aberdeen was up on the ridge last November, hunting turkeys for the Thanksgiving dinner when he came upon a black thicket of ash of ash trees under the shadow of the flint cliff, where you can see your breath in the shade even in summertime. He was resting his gun against an ancient old beech, and was reaching in his haversack for a bit of black bread when he heard something up above him. It was ratty and wispy, like the flight of a huge beetle, but he swore it was speaking. When he told us he hadn't heard, we'd all said, uh, told us what he'd heard, we all said that it tied all together. And now, none of us go hunting alone on Job Brone Ridge, not even up for the afternoon. Up there, high in the ashes, he heard it whisper, Happy and smug. Taily po, taily po. I've got my taily po. That was an interesting story. I liked that one. That was good. Thank you so much for the suggestion. That was very cool. I liked it. I like I like those old Appalachian tales and stuff like that. I think the they're they've got an interesting they've got an interesting air about them. This touch of the cryptid. It's very fun. It's got it's got like a slight Wendigo vibe, and I dig it. Alright, we're gonna do the connection live, so let's see how this goes. And I'm letting him know to just call me when he's ready. That's always good fun. We're, we're, we're having a literal fuck it, we're doing it live moment uh, where we're going to connect and all that stuff. I have no idea who Local 58 is. Oop, but we do have a call. Uh, Raina in on the call. Hello. Hello, how's it going? Experience caller, what's your horror story for the night? How you doing? Uh, my horror story for the night, starting off, is actually the one you requested from uh, Tim Burton. Ooh, hell yeah! All right, but first, before we do that, let's figure out, you know, how to see each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got let's, a lot to uh, do this live. Out. Yeah, I'm gonna just uh, hide um, the VTube Studio stuff on my visual for just a moment. Uh, so I don't accidentally oopsie doop the little haha all doxing. Um, hey, yeah. We love to see it. All right, I'm gonna t I'm gonna message you the yes word. Cool, thank you. Uh... I think I already misspelled it. Son of a bitch. Uh, maybe mixing it up with the animated CGI musical. Yeah, no, because uh, uh, Sally Epic the musical is just like a concept thing for right now. It's got like a bunch of animatics and oh, like the, the animatics, animatics are, are like done by. Though. Yeah, they're really good. Um, yeah, um, the actual uh, creator of it has actually worked alongside some of the people who make the animatics, and he used them for like the, um, mm -hmm. like the uh, the live stream and stuff like that, which he did the other yep. day. Which I'm so yep. sad. It happened while I was doing stuff, um, and then, <laughs> and then I ended up with the situation of like uh, I made a promise uh, that I wouldn't um, that I wouldn't uh, listen to it uh, before they oh. had a chance, and so I'm gotcha. like, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna listen to it with uh, Crimson tomorrow, and I'm like, I've made a promise. 
Ah, uh, that's fair. Damn that's it. fair. <laughs> uh, I was, so I was I uh, was gonna ask, did you have a chance to listen to it yet with Not Crimson? Yet. Not yet. We're uh, then to I will tomorrow. just say, yeah, I will just say it's good, um, and I'll leave it at that. It's really well done. Well, I mean, like, uh, getting the water is supposed to be in on this one. Uh, so, yes. uh, to quickly walk you through what you need to do, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to hit the VNet multiplayer collab settings thing. Okay. Uh, um, uh, you know what? I should probably hide my stuff, too. There's really a, yeah, there's a reason I'm like, I'm going to hide my thing real quick, because I don't want to accidentally oops uh, and dox myself. Um, yeah, Because I never exactly. remember what it'll show. Okay. Uh, I also love just how uh, how absolutely flattering the um, the screen capture is for the face tracking. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it totally doesn't make us look like shovels. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so <laughs> also, we're gonna go hi, down Celeste, to the. How you doing, gorgeous? Um, all right. So once you're in there, you're gonna swap from host to join. You're gonna make sure that you're on join. Uh, is V Mhm. Mm Somewhere. It should be the bottom one, the purple, like, uh, tower. Uh, on the first page, right? Yeah, it's, it's on the very first page. It's a purple symbol. It's, so when you've got your little menu thingy up on the side, it's mm -hmm. a purple symbol on the side. So you shouldn't need to go into your settings. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. It yeah, it's literally uh, on the same page that you pull your items and whatnot from. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so go to then... Yeah, it looks like a little broadcasting symbol and it's purple. Mm-hmm, I see it now. Yep, and you're going to make sure you're All ticked right, over uh, on join. Uh... Uh, what the hell? Turn through my settings, go. There we go. Um, oh, for fuck's sake. All right, give me a second. Apparently I need to, I forgot that I, my default is to uh, not run VTube Studio through Steam because of Oh, because it, it helps to, yeah, it helps yeah. take the weight off your PC. I get you. Yeah, so let me go ahead and open it up through Steam really quick. <laughs> oh, man. I forgot about that. I'm I'm very thankful. My my PC is good enough that I'm able to still run it through Steam 90% of the time, so Yeah. I just do also, this mostly a Noe, thank you so much for the raid. Hello to the raiders and random mouse variety stream on Twitch at Dragon Things usually poorly, but I usually do while singing or drinking. I'm currently doing it while doing reading scary stories with the wonderful Caleb, aka Scares VT. So please make sure to stick around for some spooky stories. I hope you had a great time on your side, but do make sure you're taking care of yourselves. Eat something, drink something, take your meds and put on your chapstick. Put your patronage is appreciated, but your health is appreciated more. So yeah, uh, you gotta have the Steam online, unfortunately, for that. Yep. Um also hi Noe, how's it going? How you doing, Noe? You were playing some Zelda. Which one were you playing? Let's see. Thank uh, you, Gilbert. You doing... Ah, Twilight okay. Princess. Good choice. Good choice. So, all right, I'm on join. All right, what do I do now? Okay, so you, I've sent you a password. Okay. And you're going to also click my name. So you're going to hit one of the little plus thingies. And you're going to click my name. And then you're going to put in the password I sent you in the section that says password. Gotcha. Mouse. Hmm. Uh, file server region. Uh, I think uh, it's Eastern? Yeah. Yeah. So, alright, I put that in. Alright, mm -hmm. wh what's next? And then there, you should see an option at the bottom there that says join. Once you put in the password. Okay, gotcha. Alright, now I see it. Yep, and once you've join. got that... Hey, there we go. Invited user entered the wrong password. <laughs> oh, what the hell? How? Oh, for fuck's sake, I missed the fucking exclamation point when I, uh, I copied it. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Whoopsies. <laughs> Oopsie doodle. <laughs> there we go. There you go. And you see there it says join Reyna. I've got join Descuris. Uh So we'll see each other in just a second here. Um. It, it, take, it takes a little bit to load sometimes. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There's the chunk. There we go. Hi. Hello. Hello. All right, now I can. Sh we can now show everybody off. 
right, and uh, if you want to put yourself in the front you left drag if you want to put uh, if you don't care about where your location is you use uh you right uh button to, to drag okay okay yeah all right there you go um let's see <laughs> I need to reference myself with your screen as well, so... Yes, I want to make sure we're not covering each other's uh, chats, because ironically enough, I think we're literally mirrored. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, also, don't forget to put yourself back up visually uh, on your screen yeah. as well. Yeah, um, there the we go. The other thing okay. as well, a uh, really nice thing that you can do, if you hit the mm -hmm. little collab participants thing, uh, you can turn on you control the position. Which oh, means you can okay. literally move me wherever you need to. I will. I will oh, end up being okay. in front of you, no matter you. Like I will end up being in front of you, and you will end up being in front. I'm. St I've stuck you to me. Oops. There we go. Uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> I forgot that. I, when you're like this, you're technically you're an accessory. Uh, so yeah. I end up having to like move you in ways that we can actually see. There we go. There we go. Okay, that that looks a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Because that way you can kind of like move me at your leisure, put me wherever you need me to go, and I can do the same to you. There we go. Okay. Cool. And there we go. Ta-da! <laughs> Tech moments with the mouse. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but see, I told you it's really fast to set up. It's just one of those things that sometimes oh, yeah. it's a little bit of troubleshooting. <laughs> All right, yes, there we go. We're we're a crowded screen because on my side we've got you're I was you're right say, yeah. underneath Gilbert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean. I think, ironically enough, both of our chats are about the same size, but um, yeah. I don't have my pet up or anything like that. I've just got, like, you know, fun background, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, now, chat would throw a riot if I did not have the uh, pets up. Oh, no, totally valid. Ow. 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 Thank you, Blaze, for throwing stuff in my face, <laughs> buddy. How you doing? And no worries, Scribbler. Uh, I don't mind when y'all are quiet. I, I'm, I'm, to be fair, I'm reading stories, so uh, if it feels like I'm ignoring you, I'm not. I'm just reading. Exactly. Yeah, that's how it is with the narration streams that I do. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's completely fair. Yeah, like I'll acknowledge followers, subscribers, and raids, but I don't always catch chat. Sometimes it's like just when something happens. Um, exactly. Speaking of, thank you, Super Games, for your uh, the follow. Grab yourself a pint, have a seat, and join the CMS adventure. Feel free to fill your drinky with pumpkin spice flavor. It is the season, after all. Tis the season. Though I'm more partial to apple cider myself. Ooh, mood. Mood. Um, but yeah, uh, at some point in a little bit, I will have to disappear for just a few minutes to uh, go give some candy treat bags to my neighbors. Because uh, my neighbor has some very sweet kids, and I found out oh. that there might be a chance that they weren't going to be able to do... Um... Oh, God, I got double rated. Ah! Ah! Triple rated. Ah! 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 What is happening? Fuck! It's all the raids! Fuck. Welcome on in, everybody! Hello to the raiders! I'm Raina the Mouse. I'm a variety streamer here on Twitch. I do variety things usually poorly, but I usually do while singing and or drinking. I'm currently doing it while reading some scary stories with the wonderful Oscar SVT, my reading partner in crime, as it were. I hope you all had yourselves a wonderful time. Uh, I see I got raided by Taylor the Rat, Folksy Doo, and uh, Double Bear. Those are some amazing names. And Maple uh, Kitty, yeah, thank you so much for the names. follow. Grab yourself a pint, have a seat, and join the Sea Miss Adventure. Um, and oh, Nesmog as well. Jesus Christ! And Magnus! Wow, Magnus what is as happening? Well. Holy shit. What is that? All the raids! I was all right. the raids! Hold on, let me take that spiel back from the top. You got this. Hello, everybody. I'm Raina the Mouse. I'm a variety streamer here on Twitch. I do variety things usually poorly, but I usually do while singing and or drinking. I'm currently doing it while hanging out with the wonderful Askir SVT, and we're doing some scary story readings, doing some spooky stuff off r slash no sleep and creepy pastas, as well as a couple of other collections. And if you came in from the raid, make sure you're taking care of yourselves. Eat something, drink something, take your meds, and put on your chapstick. Patron is appreciated, but your health is appreciated more. <gasps> How was your streams? Hell yeah, Thank that you, was uh... awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I did that all in exactly my breath. Funny. Ow. Uh, Nesmog and Magnus Jinx as well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of special events and, like, uh, just chattings and stuff like that. Um, what were you guys up to? Were you all, like, doing something together? Like, what was happening? But yeah, Something thank, like thank that so happened also... to me the other night. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I got double rated, and I'm like, oh, I recognize one name from here, but no, apparently it was not a double raid, or it was a double raid, but not, they were not, uh, streaming together. Oh, just a happy coinky dink. Got it. Yeah, exactly. 
And uh, Magnus says that uh, we were doing spooky stuff together. Hey, awesome. Oh, I hope yeah. you guys have had yourselves an absolutely baller Halloween. Uh, welcome in. Welcome in. Feel free to help yourselves to anything in the galley. Uh, just make sure that if you're taking the last of something, you ask first. Always ask for it. Be a good guest. Well, here's the thing. If I've got plenty of a something, fucking stick your face in it and just enjoy. I don't care. But if hey. it's the last of something, if it's like you're mm -hmm. the last sip of a drink or the last couple bites of a food... Then I ask that you let us know, just so that way I know that we're running low. <laughs> yeah, that's always fair. I, I run fridge rules in my galley. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, B, apparently you've acquired eggnog for midnight. Where did you find eggnog already? So, fun Most fact, I actually have eggnog in my fridge right now. Really? Oh, wow. Yes, I have, I have silk eggnog. Uh, it is lactose-free eggnog that is made with coconut and oat. Ooh. And I'm actually sounds... really excited to try it, because normally Silk sucks ass. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of Silk. <laughs> like, I'm not no the biggest offense. fan of, like, non-milk things, or, like, all milk alternatives. Oh, milk alternatives, for, yeah. Yeah, except um, for Fairlife and Lactaid. Those are fine, but that's still basically milk, just with something taken out of it. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Uh, what I use primarily is I use stuff that is uh, lactose-free, which just means that it's mm -hmm. got, like, a, it, it's just missing the, the lactose, like, in it. Uh, but mm. I can't do any kind of uh, nut-based milks because candy oh. is severely allergic. Oh, that's right. Then. Yeah. So no almond milk, no walnut milk, none of that. And hemp mm. milk tastes like a bag. Yeah, I've heard. <laughs> it's it's not good. It's not good. I've I've tried a lot of substitutes and they are not good. <laughs> uh, but surprisingly enough, Canada has a couple uh, a couple selections of milk that are uh, lactose-free, that just taste like milk. It's just some of them are, like, mildly sweeter or mildly not as sweet, yeah. that kind of yeah. thing. But yeah, no, that's welcome totally to this very spooky talk of, uh, you know, lactose. Milk products. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, that's, ooh, nothing's, nothing's, honestly, to be fair, though, nothing's scarier than a lactate, a lactose allergy and no lactate. <laughs> yeah. Or intolerance, uh, I should say. Yeah. Also, uh, Bragi, welcome back, buddy. How you doing? All right, so in about five minutes, my neighbor has uh, apparently just gotten back. Um, also, uh, if they did try to do any kind of trick-or-treating right now, I'm going to be genuinely surprised because it is absolutely fucking pissing it outside right now. It is very rainy. Oh, no. Um, uh, all of us were arguing over Halloween candy, carving pumpkins, greeting creepypastas, so we're all worn out and going to drop. Oh, yeah, no. Ah. Go, go. If you got to raid and run, go take care of yourself. Uh, exactly. We actually were talking about what your favorite Halloween candy is uh, earlier. I mentioned that mine is like those Werther's Originals or those Lemon Lollipops. Oh, okay. How about you? What's your favorite Halloween candy? Uh, Like Halloween specific candy, I'm always just a big fan of... Um, Are you a candy? Uh, trying to blank out like the name. Because, um, like, in candy in general, I love Skittles. Like, I love all the different types Ooh, of Skittles. Valley. Sour, tropical all those um and then i'm also a fan of uh some of the some of the candy that i got you guys um like the Ooh, you gave us some good like candy. the yeah like the spicy cover like mango or watermelon flavored stuff um okay it's, so you it's like all some really like good the region stuff. special candy kind of stuff too yeah i got a lot gotcha. of like region specialty candy here okie dokie gotcha, um, gotcha. but i also love Twix too Ooh, valid uh, so, actually, to let you guys know, uh, for the... Also, Magnus Jenks, thank you so much for the follow. Grab a pint, have a seat, and join the Seamus Adventure. Feel free to take your rest below deck. Um, the I made grab bags for my neighbor's kids, because uh, they're really sweet kids. Um, it's really funny. Uh, their kid absolutely lost his mind when, he, when I told him I knew who Sonic the Hedgehog was, and that Aww. I was around when the first games came out. Um, it was hilarious. Uh, he That's then proceeded to go, okay, thank you, video game lady, I love you, and then, like, disappeared into the elevator. <laughs> Aw, that's so sweet. It was, it was really funny, but, uh, for the kids, I have, I've gave, I'm giving them little grab bags, so I'm giving them a full-size Twix bar, um, I'm giving them a box of Smarties, a thing of Ritz snack, which is a little handful of chocolate caramel pumpkins and a sleeve of hot chocolate mix and a sleeve of uh, of apple cider mix. Ooh, nice. Hell yeah, that's a good grab one bag. One of my favorite things at the end of like going trick-or-treating was like having a nice hot drink and then like mm -hmm. going over the spoils afterwards. So I made one for, for him and uh, for his uh, son and daughter. 
Uh, so they're they're gonna be here in about a, a, a minute or two. So I might have to abandon you uh, real quick. No worries. I'll entertain both our chats. Sounds good. I will leave uh, them to you. Uh, I will see you in just a little bit. The Oyster Boy uh, story that I gave you is actually not super long, so that is a perfect time for you to give this one a read. I will still have an cool. earbud in so I... I can still hear you. Yeah, no worries. Perfect. All, All right, chat. All right, chats. You're under. Dad supervising you now. Mama Mouse is out. Daddy She'll, she's Mouse listening, though. So. So be good. <laughs> uh, but yes, we. I am going to read... Uh, Mummy Boy, and this is from Tim Burns' collection, The Melancholy Death of Oyster Boy and Other Stories. Um, one thing that doesn't sell it here is just the delightful artwork. Um, it's Tim Burns, you know, usual style, and it's, it's cute. Morbid, but cute. So, Mummy Boy. He was in soft and pink, with a little fat t He was hard and hollow. A little boy mummy. Tell us, doctor. Or tell us, please, doctor. The reason or cause why our bundle of joy is just a bundle of gauze. My diagnosis, he said, for better or worse, is that your son is the result of an old pharaoh's curse. That night they talked of their son's odd condition. They called him a reject from an archaeological expedition. They thought of some complex scientific explanation, but assumed it was simple supernatural reincarnation. With the uh, other young tots, he only played twice, an ancient game of virgin sacrifice. But the kids ran away, saying, You aren't very nice. Alone and rejected, Mummy Boy wept, then went to the cabinet where the snack food was kept. He wiped his wet sockets with, with his mummified sleeves and sat down to a bowl of sugar-frosted tenna leaves. One dark, gloomy day, from out of the fog, appeared a little white mummy dog. For his newfound wrapped pet, he did many things, like building a doghouse a la Pyramid of Kings. It was late in the day, just before dark. Mummy Boy took his dog for a walk in the park. The park was empty, except for a squirrel, and a birthday party for a Mexican girl. La Raza! <laughs> the boy and the girls had all started to play, but noticed that thing that looked like paper mache. Look, it's a piñata, said one of the boys. Let's crack it wide open and get the candy and toys. They took a baseball bat and whacked open his head. Mummy boy fell to the ground. He was finally dead. Inside of his head were no candy or prizes, just a few stray beetles of various sizes. Damn, okay, that is dark. <laughs> Holy shit. There's a reason I was like, okay, this is going to be a fun one because it's actually one of the darker ones without it being, like, <laughs> too dark, but also very silly. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. It was great. Also, I'm Mexican so Cat, good. thank you so much for the lurk. I appreciate you. And then there was another raid the moment I said All the raids! Jesus Christ. Well, this one I was like, I, I was like, all right, at least first person I know for sure. Hi, Maidu! Uh, hello to the raiders. I'm Raina the Mouse, a variety streamer here on Twitch. I do variety things usually poorly, but I usually do while singing and or drinking. I'm currently doing it while hanging out with the wonderful Caleb of Skira SPT, reading some spooky stories for this Hollow's Eve. If you came in from the raid, do make sure you're taking care of yourselves, eat something, drink something, take your meds and put on your chapstick. Patronage is appreciated, but your help is appreciated more. <gasps> what spooky game are you playing? You were doing, oh, you were doing, oh, you were doing hot, dark lesbians. Signalis, how was it? Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> I gotta see, I gotta see how Reyna describes Signalis in this great. I mean, tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> You're not. I mean, I played it. That's actually like Spooky one of the first. cybernetic lesbians. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the first like scary games like I really, really enjoyed because it just got the, it just got the brain like 
working on that, and I was like, it got me my God, on that. so good. Well, and it's also just the realization, um, thought crime techno lesbians, yeah! Um, yeah. I, one of the other things that also gets me about it is the fact that, like, you, you get, like, a good amount of supplies, but you don't get, like, a lot of them. So it's not yeah. until late game that you realize just how much you could have, like, salvaged, and you're like, oh, I should have maybe thought this one a little bit further ahead, because you don't realize some of the shit you're about to fight. Yeah. God, there's no, some a... Of the shit, some of that shit scared the fuck out of me, too. It was so freaky. I know. Uh, spoilies to anybody who may not have uh, played Signalis and or has not finished it. I'm assuming you finished it, uh, Caleb. Uh, I finished it, actually, I f and I got, like, uh most of the endings i think the only one i that i'm missing is the one that you get from like replaying the game and collecting all like the hidden stuff ah okay so i've i've only played through it the once uh i really enjoyed it uh, i wouldn't mind actually doing it again and i wouldn't mind actually having someone co-ride with me just like to remind me of shit because my god i got so spacey uh playing it but it was such a good time um but the fucking uh the the ones that kind of remind me of the big daddies from uh bioshock yeah those motherfuckers. That freaked me the fuck out the first time I saw it. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. oh god, no. Yeah, no, those are terrifying. I love and hate them so much. Yeah. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you... So, uh, Meidu says that she got the memory ending. Oh, uh, I... God, which one's the memory? Also, I have uh, opted over from uh, iced tea to cider. Ooh, nice. Yeah. The match of the season, so. I'm here with my nice crisp apple cider and my ah, even I know nicer one. spicy demonio. I'm having a Yay. wonderful time. <laughs> I'm so always I happy to join in. Even if oh, it's not I'm, the spicy I just, I love just being able to do, like, whenever, I'll, I'll be straight with you. Whenever I think reading streams, I think of you. And so being hey. able to join you for reading streams again, uh, even of the non-spicy variety. Just, ah, uh, it's very, very fun. And I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad that's sort of becoming my my thing, because that's kind of like, that's kind of what I w want to do, especially a little bit more serious, like, narrations, if I can swing it when, uh, when I actually have the time and actually, like, mm -hmm. record, like, serious, like, little audiobooks. I would love to do that. Yeah. Um, oh, I'd love to hear that. Um, I actually just got uh, upgrades to my uh, my audio equipment that won't be for stream, but specifically will actually be for uh, audio recordings. So voiceovers, reading, singing, stuff like that. Oh, yeah. um, I'm really excited. I'm really, really excited. And also, we love you, Sketchy. Also, Grimlock, you got to let me know what that cocktail uh, sounds like. Uh, and Maidu, please go go take care of yourself. Uh, I feel so bad. Maidu got sick while she visited me. <laughs> Oh no! Oh, that sucks. Some some plague carrier happened to be on transit the same day I went to pick up Maydu from uh from the plane, and um, now all three of us, myself, Candy, and Maydu, all got sick. Oh no! Yeah, so uh, <coughs> I um was uh very very sick um for the last couple days, and on last weekend I in fact lost my voice almost entirely. <laughs> Uh, ooh. That's a way no. Yeah. Uh, also, Silly, uh, feel free to link me that story for scary stories to tell in, in the dark, uh, and we'll put it on the, uh, we'll put it on the, uh, the docket. Solid, solid choices. Uh, mm -hmm. that one's, um, that one's really fun. Uh, also my friend Dante drew the Bride of Chucky. Ooh, hell yeah, I'd love to see ooh. that. Um, yeah, that, that would be great. Also, apparently, uh, by my my friend who's my neighbor uh his his kid just opened up because i made actual little grab bags right mm -hmm. so uh he didn't know what was in, what he was getting until he actually opened up the bag and apparently he is extremely stoked and is currently singing my praises <laughs> oh that's so <laughs> the weird nerd lady came clutch for halloween <laughs> yeah kids are great um my own nephew he sent me a little like crocheted uh wiener dog um Aww. yeah it it made me like both really happy and it also broke my heart uh for like anybody who's mainly for reina side who doesn't know i lost um uh, i lost my wiener dog back in august and yeah. it's been really hard um and that was when my nephew and my sister were here. 
And my nephew, he's such a sweet kid. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's, he always wants to hang out with me whenever he's here. So, and I always oblige him. And yeah. Let's see. Where? Is she? Ah, there it is. Ooh. God, the art for scary stories to tell in the dark is great. So I'm taking a look at that. Ooh, that's really good. That art is real good. So, uh, let's see. So, uh, which story specifically would you want us to read, Sally? And how would you want to do this, Reina? Do you want us to sort of take a like a story at a time or, uh, uh or I separate think we could do, I, I figure we could do story at a time. Um, if they're particularly <laughs> long stories, uh, then like we can like kind of rotate between or do what we do with like, uh, Radley's where if someone shows as male or female presenting, uh, the other person does the voice for that character, that kind of thing. Got uh, so we can share the stories in between each other. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. we can do that then. Um, since I just read a story right now, um, let's go with a story that you've got. Okay. Um, I have a little collection of different ones. Um, some of these are, all, like, this one's not super long, actually. That's not too bad. So I'll, I'll do this one. Um, so I went with a mix of stuff from r slash no sleep and a couple from, uh, creepypasta.com. I have spent... Cool. Way too much uh, lost hours of the night reading r slash no sleep uh, late into yeah. the bed. Uh, I am just like laying there and like looking over at my clock and going, "Oh God, that's the time I need to go to bed." Um, yeah. I love I love um, like people's uh, spooky stories and whatnot. Um, I so I know exactly this collection that um, Sally uh, just sent us. Because they based okay. the movie off of this, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I remember they, uh, they that came up on like Netflix one time when I was looking around. Um, so I, how long are some of these stories? Actually, well done. Yeah. Huh. Cool. Um, because one of the fun things is it, it's done from the perspective of the person reading the stories, and they used primarily practical effects. That's cool. That's uh, really for sick. one of the. For one of the characters in particular, they actually had a contortionist uh, be the actor for it. And all did a very good job. Very, very good Hell job. Hell yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, they're all fairly they're similar Similar in vain to the melancholy death of Oyster Boy. Um, <laughs> they're all fairly short. It's just a collection of these kinds of stories. Gotcha. So we can, okay, we can cool. bust through like a couple of these, honestly. Oh, hell yeah. Cool. All mm -hmm. right, cool. So all I'm right, ready to so get going. All right. Uh, so this one is from r slash no sleep by the user verse uh, Verastal, uh, V E R A S T A H L, um, mm -hmm. and this is. I'm gonna send you the link to this one. Okay. I'll cool. Yeah. So you can follow along. Yeah. Oop. Um. Gracias. And this story is uh, from six years ago. My job is watching a woman trapped in a room. Ooh. Excuse me while I try to make my sinuses stop fighting me. My god, cold suck. Alright. Yeah. Take care of yourself, Sir May, and Butcher, good morning. Good morning. Three years ago, I was looking at a local job classifieds online when one of the ads caught my eye. Not because of what it said, but because it said so little. Best I remember, the ad just read... Job available. Good pay. No benefits. Discretion required. It then listed an email address, and that was all. At the time, I was managing a music store, but I'd already started hearing rumors that we would be shutting down within the next year, and the likelihood of a transfer to another store was slim. I'd been morosely looking at job listings for the last few days, but this was the first one that stood out, if only because I was bored and it was weird. So, I sent an email. Half an hour later, I had a response telling me to go to a particular office building in an upscale part of the city at the precise time for my screening. I went, 
and after waiting for a few minutes in the lobby, I was taken into an office where I was given a series of forms and questionnaires to fill out. They collected them and told me they would be in touch. I'd almost forgotten about the whole thing until a month later I got a call saying I had moved on to the second stage of the hiring process. I was again given an address and a time, and when I arrived, this time it was a different nice office park 20 miles away from the first one, I was met by a man who introduced himself as Mr. Solomon. He escorted me into a large room that contained a chair and a desk. On the desk were two large monitors, a keyboard and a mouse, and a bolted down metal box with two oversized buttons on it. One red, one green. He told me this room was a model for the place I would be working if I took the job. He described the job as follows. I would be working seven shifts of six hours every week. My job would be simple. I would arrive at, the, at work ten minutes early and enter an outer area that was a locker room. I would have my own personal locker. I would store all belongings in the locker and change into the provided work clothes. I was never, under any circumstances, carry any item of my own into the surveillance room. I was never, under any circumstances, to take any item with me from the surveillance room. As for what I was to do in the surveillance room, I was told that the monitor on the left would constantly show a live stream from a high-definition camera in a remote location. My job was simply to watch the camera. Once an hour, I would go onto the computer attached to the right monitor and enter a brief log describing anything interesting that occurred in the last hour. I would have no pens or pencils or paper, and I should never try to take any kind of written notes about work. As for the red and green buttons, the red button was only to be used if there was an emergency. This meant something on the video or in my workspace that required outside help. The green button was to be hit if I saw something on the video feed that was particularly noteworthy. It would tell other people somewhere that, at least in my opinion, something interesting was going on. Solomon stressed that while I was given discretion on when I use this button, I should err on the side of only using it if and when something of real significance occurred. He pointed out the camera on the ceiling of the room we were in. He said the real room would be the same. My work would be observed, and other people were watching the room on the video feed as well. He said I was only a redundancy in case other systems failed. He then smirked and asked if I knew what he meant by redundancy. I nodded, trying not to show my irritation. I don't talk that good to people, so sometimes they think I'm dumb. That's okay. Let him think that if he paid me good enough. The pay was very good. $35 an hour. This worried me. I was already thinking this was some kind of psych experiment or secret government job, which I was okay with. But that kind of money to sit and watch a screen? My mom always told me that if something seems too good to be true, it probably is, and this was seeming too good to be true. I asked if I was going to be doing anything illegal. Solomon laughed and said no. I asked if anyone was going to get hurt. Again, he shook his head no. He said the reason they were paying so much was because they needed employees that were motivated to be professional and discreet. The work they were doing was important, and for various reasons that couldn't be discussed, if I took the job, I would have to sign papers promising I would never discuss my work there, or I could be sued or locked up. I'm only breaking that now because of everything that's happened. So, I took the job. And because they wanted me to start right away, I had to quit the store with no notice. I felt bad about that, but I was excited about the new job too. It was a lot of money, and seemed like easy enough work, if a bit boring. I was nervous that there was something more to it, but I told myself that I would just have to see. No point in chickening out and wasting a good chance because I let my imagination go crazy. I was given the location of the job itself, and when I went there, I was amazed that it really was like a model of like the model room I had been shown with only a few differences. There was a locker room you had to pass through to enter the surveillance room, and there was a small bathroom attached to the real surveillance room also. The real room had a small water cooler in the corner, but because I wasn't allowed to bring anything in with me, I had to eat before or after every shift. The biggest difference, of course, was the monitors were turned on. The right monitor was just as black, with just a black and white terminal like you see in the movies sometimes. I could type in my logs, but no internet to look in anything like that. The left monitor, it was a video from a room. You would call it a bedroom, I guess, but because it had a bed in it, but it had lots of other stuff too. A TV, sofa and chairs, a couple of tables, and plenty of empty space in between. The camera must be high up in the corner because I could see pretty much everything except for the far sides of the furniture. At first, though, I didn't notice any of that stuff. All I saw was her. She looked to be a little older than me and was very pretty. When I first saw her, she was laying on her side on the sofa. That was the part of the room farthest from the camera, but the picture was so very clear and I could tell that she was sleeping. 
I found myself leaning into the monitor more so I could see her better, and then I thought about what I was doing and felt embarrassed. It's like I was spying on her. A peeping Tom, my mom used to call it. I didn't want to be a peeping Tom, but I didn't want to be silly either. I needed to think about it slow. It was a good job. I wasn't doing anything wrong, right? I wasn't hurting anybody. The woman looked fine, and the room was nice. She probably agreed to be there, and it was all some experiment or something. I was just overreacting. So I sat down in the chair and began my work. Uh, there are these breaks that happen in the story, so we can swap between breaks if you want. Okay, cool, yeah. No, I can take over. It didn't take long before I understood more. The woman, I took to calling her Rachel, wasn't there of her free will. I never saw her hurt, but it was clear that she never left that room except to go into what I think is a bathroom area that my camera couldn't see. Well, she never left the room on her own. Periodically, usually a couple times a week during my shifts, men and women in strange looking outfits would come in and take her from the room. Sometimes she would struggle, but usually she would just go along with her head hung low. They would always bring her back, though the times when she wasn't brought back during my shift were always the worst. I would worry about her until I got to work the next day and saw her in the room watching TV or painting. She never looked hurt or even that upset except for when they took her, and even when she fought, they were always gentle with her. Still, I knew something was wrong. I considered quitting the job, or hitting the red button and getting someone to come so I could get some answers, or calling the police and showing them what the camera was showing me. Except I was scared. Scared of losing my job, and scared of what these people might do to me if I quit or told on them. Solomon had told me when I took the job that that part of being discreet was not asking questions. I would never be asked to do more than what I had already been told, but I could never tell anyone what I did or saw, and I could never ask questions about what I was doing or why. So I made excuses. It was all an experiment. She was crazy or sick and were trying to help her. She was doing a job just like I was. Or, if she really was a prisoner somewhere, at least I was watching to make sure that she was okay. If they ever tried to hurt her, or I saw that she really didn't want to be, be there for sure, I could get help then. In a way, I told myself I was helping to protect her by watching. I don't expect you to think much of my excuses. I don't think much of them myself, especially now. But in my defense, when things change, I didn't ignore it or try to explain it away. I knew something had to be done. Rachel would usually paint for an hour or two every day, and it seemed to always be during my afternoon shifts. The room had no windows as far as I could tell, but I guess she either used a clock or her own body's time to keep a kind of schedule. I always liked to watch her paint. The thing she was painting was always facing the wrong way for me to see it, but I could see her face as she worked. She always looked peaceful and happy when she was painting, and seeing her that way, smiling serenely from time to time as she got something the way she wanted it, always made my day. I first noticed something was wrong when she started painting more frequently a few weeks ago. Her expression was more focused and serious, and there was a tension to her movements that I wasn't used to seeing. At first I thought she was just really trying to work hard on something, and I wanted to tell her not to worry. Every few weeks, the others would come in and take the old paintings out anyway, bringing in the new Quick stuff pause. and the word co Yep. Oh, raid. <laughs> oh. Vexing Cat, thank you so much for the raid. I greatly appreciate it. Welcome on in, everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, my God. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of folk. Uh, Vexing Cat, welcome back. Lasada, welcome back. Or er, welcome in for the first time. Space Circus, welcome in. Bar Barzi? I don't know how to say that name. Barzi, uh, welcome on in. <laughs> Uh, Void Baron Jewels, I love that name. Uh, and Fallen Thespian. And like uh, Almantas VT, welcome on in. Uh, that name I do recognize. Uh, how Hi. are you guys doing tonight? Thank you so much for the raid. Uh, I'm currently joined by my friend, my dear friend, Raina the Mouse. We are doing a spooky scaries for Halloween. We're currently reading, uh, pull up the name for the story, 
my job is watching a woman trapped in a room. Um, it is a creepypasta over on No Sleep on Reddit. Fixing Cat, thank you so much for the follow. Uh, uh, for anybody who is new. Hi, how's it going? My name is Caleb Oscuris. I'm your resident Demon King. I am a variety VTuber. I tend to talk about storytelling in video games, character uh, development, and that kind of good stuff. I also like talking about heavy topics because that's just how my brain works. Um, and I also do narration streams. I'm currently reading The Council Monte Cristo, though that's on a bit of a pause right now because we're celebrating Halloween by reading spooky stories. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you guys so much for the follows, Void Baron Jules and Barkzy. Thank you so much. <laughs> they said Bar is also fully okay. <laughs> uh, bar is fully okay. Cool. I missed that. <laughs> no, it's all good. I was I'm like, getting... that way you don't have to struggle through it each time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and give a shout out to Vexing Cat. Thank you so much for the raid again, and I will return the favor by dropping you a cheeky follow. Heck yeah. Uh, but what, were you, what were you guys up to? And and I totally understand if you guys need to raid and run, uh, you're more than welcome to just to drop by, all that kinds of good stuff. But uh, yeah, I hope the stream went well. What were you guys doing? And I hope you guys had fun. If I were to read from the like raid you. message, uh, it says, Leaving Spooktober Scary Stories for more scary stories. Were you also reading the spooky? Ooh. <laughs> Lots of new friends. We got we got space fish, space circus, all the friends. Oh, hot damn! Holy Look at shit! That's reading awesome. streams of spooky stories with nine readers. Hella, that's awesome! Wow, that's awesome. Uh, and I always extend this to everybody. Uh, feel free to join my Discord. Uh, I run a pretty chill ship, uh, for the most part. Uh, but I do actively allow for people to self promo, share what you guys are working on share you know work in progress or share when you're going live or or a youtube video whatever you guys are got going on i'm i'm more than welcome to let you guys have a space to share it um and yeah no join the discord drop by say hi all that kinds of good stuff caleb is but, genuinely like a 10 out of 10 fella and has one of the chillest discords i'm in it's it, there's a reason that every time i do a discord purge his lives hey Thank you so much. I appreciate <laughs> it for the vote of confidence. <laughs> um, also, where I, else I would that... I dump all the amazing clips of you screaming? Oh, God, the clips of me screaming. <laughs> oh. You, oh, you know what? I forgot to bring this up when we were talking about Epic uh, before we continue with the spooky story. You know how uh, you know how I started calling the ghost Jorge? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> the name of the fucking guy who writes Epic, his name fucking Jorge. <laughs> yep. I was I wasn't and gonna I, say a word until you realized. <laughs> and I just can't believe I started I I, I said Pinchi Jorge Cagado live on stream and I'm like, oh god. Yeah, this it's could be so taken funny. out of context. <laughs> also <laughs> you got a raid. I did, I just got a raid as well. Crystal Luna, thank you so much for the raid. Oh, Hello to the Raiders. I'm Raina the Mouse, variety streamer here on Twitch. I do variety things usually poorly, but I usually do it while singing and or drinking. I'm currently doing it while reading some spooky stories with the wonderful Caleb, aka Oscurus VT, drinking some apple cider and having a good time. I saw you were doing some just chatting. What were you chatting about? And if you came in from the raid, please make sure to take care of yourselves. Eat something, drink something, take your meds and put on your chapstick. Patronage is appreciated, but your health is appreciated more. Welcome on in, everybody. How you guys doing? Uh, yeah, thank you. And again, uh, thanks to both raids on both sides. That's mm -hmm. fucking fantastic. You guys are awesome. We appreciate you. I mean, to be you fair, Grimlock, the void is a is a dark and bitter place. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Also, the name Space Circus. That is a great name, by the way, as well. I, I know, um, and I love the little dancing. Uh, what is that? So cute. Sorry to raid and dash. Happy Halloween. No worries, Crystal Luna. You take care of yourselves. Take a big deep rest. Raiding and running is totally valid. Feel free to rest below deck. And it was a tag team. Ooh, Vanstren. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. By the way, on people on my side, if you guys haven't already followed Rain of the Mouse, you definitely should do so. Rain is fantastic. Very Smart. sweet, very kind, and very saucy. Oh, that I can definitely confirm. Uh, but hey. one of the other things as well is the fact that Caleb is an absolutely amazing person. Iskira Sweet T has one of those voices that I could listen to for hours. And I do. I sometimes don't tell them when I'm listening to stuff in their chat while Aww. I'm quietly working away. Uh, and I 
honestly love getting the opportunities I get to read with them whenever I do. So please go send them some love as well. Uh, speaking of love being shared, vexing the cat, uh, vexing cat. Thank you so much for the follow. Grab yourself a pint, have a seat, and join the sea misadventure. <laughs> like I'm not gonna uh, drive by, you. compliment you whenever I get the opportunity. Hey. <laughs> uh, and you know I will always do the same. Mi querido demonio. Aww. You flatter me. You flatter always, me. And forever. <laughs> hey, take care of yourself, Blaze. Mwah. Take care. Take care, Blaze. See you Thank later, you. buddy. <laughs> also, people on my side, we got an ad break starting here in just a little bit. Um, I normally, think I, I would. Too, take... actually. <laughs> oh, hey. Uh, normally, I would take a break, uh, but since we're doing a collab, if we haven't added around the same time, I think we'll probably just take a little bit of a break at the we, same time. Then. I was going to say, we could just do a shared break. Yeah, um, okay. that, that works for me because uh, I, yeah, I got the little through. notice thingy um, a little bit ago saying like, hey, it uh, looks like an ad's going to start soon. So, Gotcha. All right, cool. So, yeah, if, you, uh, if you're more than welcome to continue until it's ready for ad break, and then uh, I'll just I'll, I'll Watch say ad break. Watch the moment I open my mouth. Um, no, we still got three minutes on my end. Yeah, I my timer is not there for me for some reason, so I don't know like oh when my my ad break is going to happen. Nor do I know. Oh, there we go. Hey, <laughs> now mine has started. <laughs> and it's funny because then after your ads and mine are gonna start. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> we're literally That's oh hilarious. no, we're like a two minute break. Oh no, oops. Oh, geez. <laughs> Whoopsie. I, I wish I'd seen my thing. I could have delayed it. Um, uh, when my next ad break happens, I'll uh, I'll I'll hit the delay button uh, as soon as it shows up, so that we're a little bit closer in time. I think. Gotcha. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking timing. <laughs> yeah, I know you're immune to ads, Bragi, with your tier three sub. Flaunted, hey, we appreciate flaunted. those with ad immunity. Yeah. <laughs> Um, throwing money at our faces helps uh but i also i also encourage you guys not to not to sub if you guys don't want to because twitch is uh twitch is evil sometimes with how it does oh, yeah, uh, no, without uh, poppy bezos does not have your best intentions in mind so if you want to support mm -hmm. us in other ways please do mm -hmm. i also still need to, have to find the time to sit down and read uh grimlock's book because i now actually have it in hand oh hell yeah yeah um i will also say uh, I forgot about this. Uh, this story mm -hmm. is actually a multi-parter. We only need to read part one if we want to, uh, and okay. we can like come back to it later if we want. But there are other plenty good stories that uh, we can visit instead. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, no, let's read part one for right now, and then uh, then we can visit something else. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Um, speaking of good stories that are short, though, I recently finished today. Um, it is called a uh, delivery of flowers. And it's written by, well, they their name is Frances Corvo, and they go by Fashionable Crow on like TikTok and stuff. And their whole thing is like comparing books to Bloodborne or Elden Ring. And um, their book is a short little novella about like ten chapters or something like that. And it tells the story of like of a monster hunter uh, trying to. Uh, trying to uh deliver some flowers to this girl that he's seeing and um it is really sweet but it's also got like that sort of bloodborne very creepy eldritch horror vibes to it and i i, I absolutely love that story it's a really sweet story yeah Dude, Grimlock, fuck, I haven't budgeted for that. That's a mood. Hey. <laughs> that is a mood The Castlevania, yeah. The Vampire Survivor stuff is out now. So I need to do that, too. Mm. Also, uh, another game came out today, uh, since we're still sort of on the ad break type of yeah, ride right now. Yeah, I something came out today. Uh, well, we, ha we have Dragon Age the Veil Guard, which is uh, one thing I also want to play. But we also got the remastered uh, Shadows of the Damned. Um, and if... Maybe some some of you guys might remember this game. I think this was this game was exclusive on Xbox 360, and it is a Suda 51 game um, that tells the uh, story of uh, Hartsper Garcia on his basically journey through 
basically hell to uh, get his girlfriend back. It is this wacky, uh, like survival action horror type game. Um, I actually have the original box. Let me grab it. Hmm. Yeah, so it's a. Uh, it is a twisted psychological action thriller from the team of Suda51, Shinji Mikami, and Akira Yamaoka. Uh, Garcia Hotspur has killed one too many demons and pissed off the lord of the underworld. Now he's about to take one hell of a trip to rescue his kidnapped love in the city of Dan. Um, and the other thing, too, is a lot of the creature design was was des er, was well designed by Kyu Hayashida, who is the mangaka behind, um, behind um, Doro Hedoro, if you guys know that uh, anime or manga. It's, uh, uh, yeah, no, Shadows of the Dam is absolutely wacky. It doesn't take itself so seriously, and it's just, I played it a long time ago. It's a lot of fun, and I really want to revisit it. Very cool. Yeah. Also, oh my god, Grimlock. Yeah, no wonder it was so bitter. Jeez. Oh, Broggy, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I oh, love just like, I don't know why, it's like, that just reminds me of, like, whenever someone's reading a baking recipe and they accidentally read tablespoons instead of teaspoons. Yeah. Oh, uh, and you, and it's so fucked with baking, too, because, like, baking has to be, like, an exact science, and you, uh... And oh, yeah, you... no, baking is a science. And that's yeah. saying, no, rating and running is totally valid. Please, go take care of yourself. Exactly. Reyna took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, yeah, go eat. Go take care of yourself. I'm still going to be here for a little bit longer. Um, so, yeah, you're more than welcome to come back. And mm. and if you haven't joined the Discord, I do recommend that you do. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I have an open space for, for creatives to share their stuff. It's always a chill vibe. So even when we're talking about the heavy stuff, we're always trying to be chill and, and welcoming to everybody. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, go take care of yourself. I will say it is kind of funny to be uh, taking the words out of your mouth because I'm usually more interested in putting something in it. Oh my! <laughs> oh my! I gotta put the blushy. There you go. Oh, <laughs> oh my! Uh, I can't help myself when I'm around. <laughs> too endearing. Oh, fuck it! Now I have to finish this <laughs> cup for the sake of my pride. For your pride, as a saint. Finish it. I believe in you. It's time to go even further beyond! <laughs> One step beyond! It, d immediately bombastic ska. And, um... Uh, <laughs> Celeste, I have actually been really enjoying Blue Sky. I've actually been using Blue Sky for... almost a year now? A bit longer than that? Um, I, 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 was, I was using it back when uh, it was still, uh, like, you had to have, like, an invite code. Mm-hmm. And it was really funny because uh, when they opened up and then they started getting a whole bunch of people, uh, they had like a little, like, you know, like a little celebration party popper thingy. Um, they had that emote at the top of Blue Sky and I clicked it and it's like, hey, do you want to celebrate uh, what number you were when you joined? Uh, and I was like, number like, I think like 400 and something thousandth. Oh, wow. Um, That's nuts. Yeah, so I was... I was I was before the initial massive wave, but I was uh, I wasn't part of the second wave, but I was part of the very first wave when Blue Sky started becoming appealing. After I think, um, Twitter made yet another bad decision that made a lot of people want to leave. Yeah, and also at that same time, Blue Sky's just been adding stuff. Like I didn't in yeah. I didn't use it initially, um, but then like when you can post like gifts, videos, um, mm -hmm. photos, stuff like that. Once you once Blue Sky really took off with its features, that's when I started using it a lot more, and totally I'm so valid. glad that you know. I, that's why I'm so glad it's you know I, I started using it now. Yeah, um, uh, Delta. It was a it was a short period thing when um the massive uh exodus happened, um because they hit over a million uh like new um accounts and stuff like that, and so uh then they were like, hey, do you want to celebrate where you were in the milestones? And I'm like, eh. Um, the, but the fun thing for me was like, I was, I was there in the early stages of Blue Sky. I was there when they didn't have DMs, they didn't have GIF, oh. uh, 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 availability yet. They didn't have videos, uh, and video integration was real iffy. Like it had to be like Imgur 
or like certain files specifically otherwise it just wouldn't work and autoplay oh. was real touch and go um and uh you would not believe how excited i was the moment that blue sky finally integrated a pinned post function because yep. when it when i joined it didn't have that it only recently got that after the most recent exodus they're just getting better and better each time which is which is great i'm, I'm really happy about it i think my favorite thing about it though was uh their open message about their concept of ai and stuff like that they're like mm -hmm. literally the only ai integration we have is the ones that we use for going over images to see if they're not safe for work but none of it's mm -hmm. actually saved or logged and none of it is used for training ai uh or mm -hmm. training anything else also if you don't one of the people's biggest things about um like going oh well you're moving to blue sky because you don't want your art to get scraped but you can't even look at the art if you don't have a twitter account so like you could just like be not logged into twitter and can't see anything but if you go to blue yeah. sky they've got an open feed at the front yeah. you know that there's a function right there's a there's a moderation function that is it turns off mm -hmm. your posts to people who are logged off exactly yeah and and here's the thing, like this is this is something like one of my classes actually talked about this re fairly recently. Uh, just to touch on this quickly, I am like, I am okay with the use of AI when it comes to the uses of like what what Blue Sky is doing. It's using it just to scan if it's not safe for work material, right? It's used for like data analysis or like or like there's even like they're even trying to train AI to detect like breast cancer in in uh. Yeah in patients and stuff like that i saw that, that actually, is uh, you... the recent research about that that was really interesting yeah that's how you use ai um yeah. and i, I... Had, and i've made this argument in my class that's like yeah no using ai that's fine like that but don't use it mm -hmm. to, to to steal the soul from artists that's the only thing i don't like about it you should not use ai in lieu of your own creativity and skill mm -hmm. and you should exactly. not use it as a crutch to overcompensate for something that you could learn as a skill exactly yes I 100% um, I agree. There is very healthy integration use of AI in the mm -hmm. art world. Not really. Like, no. It should not be used to essentially skate or scrape um, and take from others. It should not take. It should. Cr it should be able to adapt knowledge that is already available. Exactly. Yes. One hundred percent. Yes. A tool uh, to assist I'm the workflow, not brain. to replace it. Exactly. Yeah. Also, Void Bear. But yeah, Thank we're, you so much I'm ready on my end. Pilot, I... Have a seat and join the Seamus Adventure. <laughs> hey. Thank you. Hopefully my enticing row about AI and don't be a shithead when you're using it was what it convinced you to join the crew. <laughs> hey. I, I have lots of hot takes. I, that's usually whatever. That usually is what takes a lot of time out of my streams at the beginning because like there's some hot take that I have that I needed to, to get off my chest. And mm -hmm. I was like, let me fucking talk about this really quick. And then I end up yapping for an hour. And then it's like, oh, shit, we yapped for an hour and not even playing the game yet. Yeah, I, I will. <laughs> Vin, hot take. Reyna, thank you. But hey. why are you, where are you taking me? Where are you taking me? Um, but nope. uh, no, I, um, <laughs> I think um, the thing is a valid, like a, a hot takes discussion can be productive and fun. Mm -hmm. So long as mm -hmm. everyone is respectful about the conversation. Um, a lot of times these kinds of things are considered hot takes because people's response to it is immediately negative or immediately intense or, oh, well, you're wrong and you should feel bad. And it's like, well, yeah. that's not very conducive to the argument now, is it? Because it's because exactly. that's the thing. We're trying to make an argument, not a discussion. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's my whole point is like whenever like I tried talking about stuff, it's like it's it's why I probably am not like, you know, uh like i know like some people probably don't watch for one reason or another or don't stick around is because yeah like i i will very purposely like poke the bear of certain like topics because it's like i i kind of i kind of have this opinion i gotta want i kind of want to talk about it and i want to engage and see what other people think about x y or z topic mm -hmm. um uh, not to go too much into it, so we can get back into the story. But like, I I, I have a hot take that <laughs> Doing like what exactly what we were just talking about. <laughs> uh, but it was just like VTubers and cosplayers. There's a lot of overlap in the type of like bullshit that they pull, uh, and it's like no one community is better than the other in terms of like the 
the like incidents that tend to happen out of both of those communities they, they like it's basically if those two were a venn diagram of like bullshit that happens with them it is almost a complete circle yeah no i can agree with that honestly yeah. um but uh, before we go off on yet another tangent because my god like the moment you started talking about that i'm like well i hate to say it but also furries and cartoon watchers yeah practically mm-hmm. the same circle in that regard for how things go in the communities as well it's a, ah! yep. <laughs> it's, it's a nightmare but yeah um yeah no it's uh I, I and that's the thing i like people being able to like have that kind of discussion without it being mm-hmm. you know too 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 aggravating because it just sounds like two people shouting at each other exactly yeah i always try to avoid that especially if it's like me talking to chat is that because mm-hmm. it's like you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have like that. You gotta temper responses, right? And that, so, especially if you're you're not face to face or call to call, I guess. Yeah, and the, Zach actually nailed it there. It just turns out, regardless of the community, people be people wherever they are. Honestly, exactly. yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, that's what someone said the, the other day. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, you, you finish yeah. your sentence and then we'll, we'll carry on. Oh, no, no, no. That's just, that's all I wanted to say. Somebody said something similar the other day, too. Mm-hmm. All right. <coughs> Every few <laughs> weeks, the others would come in and take the old paintings out. Anyway, bringing in a new stack of, I think the word is canvas. But it was more than her being focused. Something was wrong. She didn't look happy and she was going for hours at a time. In the span of three days, she had finished four paintings. I had been growing more and more worried watching her work, and when she finished her fourth, I found myself telling her to just stop and rest a while. I'd grown accustomed to talking to the monitor, talking to her in my own way, but she didn't stop. Instead, she began moving the paintings, arranging them on the back and seat of the long sofa at the far end of the room. This was the first time I'd gotten to see any of the paintings. Even when the others were taking them out, they always seemed to be turned away from the camera. I was still worried about her, but I was also happy to finally see something she'd worked on. Happy and amazed. They were beautiful. One was a beautiful green forest. Another was an old stone well. A third was a house sitting alone on a small island. The last was an old-fashioned looking movie theater. All of them looked like something out of a dream, with trailing lines of color mixing in the air around them like leaves caught in the wind. It was only when I looked close that I realized the lines of color weren't random. They were words. Easy to miss if you weren't looking close, and by themselves they didn't seem to mean much. Just the ghost of a word somewhere in each of the paintings, easy to lose in everything else that was being shown. I leaned into the monitor and squinted, trying to read the words. Then my heart started thudding as I made them out. Blinking and rubbing my eyes, I looked again, reading them out loud in order. Left to right, top pair then bottom. Please help me, Thomas. I pushed back from the monitor, my hand over my mouth. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how any of this could be happening. It wasn't just that she was asking for help, though that was a big part of it. It was that my name is Thomas. Oh, shit. Yeah. Ooh, that's good. (laughs) If we don't get back to this one tonight, I'm definitely going to read that one later. Yeah, I highly recommend. It's a if I remember correctly, I think it's a three parter in total. Uh, but oh, I remember okay. like binging it, uh, like the night that I found it. It was very good. Ooh, nice. Let's see. Wait, there's something. Someone's got something to say. Oh, no! Oh. Oh, hi, pumpkin. It's pumpkin. <laughs> pumpkin, the best critique. Yep. Uh, if uh, for people on Reina's side, I've got a uh, orange tabby Maine Coon, and her uh, her name's Pumpkin. She's my she is she's my cat. She loves chilling out with me, and she's vocal some nights. Most nights, it's really funny. Yeah, because because one time she actually uh, she demanded her food right then and there, and she clawed at my ass while I was in the middle of uh, trying to play Elden Ring, and I died. <laughs> I still just oh. remember it was one of our Radley's readings and just hearing me, me, me. Then it's like, yep. oh, you're so cute. Oh, she's precious. I love you, you little distraction. 
<laughs> let's see. Where? Let's see. Let's let's take one of the ones from the scary stories to tell in the dark. Okay. I think I will read then the walk. This is uh, page ten of the document that Sally ah, sent us. Yeah, I have it open in another uh, tab. <laughs> cool. All right. The walk. My uncle was walking down a lonely dirt road one day. He came upon a man who was also walking down that road. The man looked at my uncle, and my uncle looked at him. The man was scared of my uncle, and my uncle was scared of that man. But they kept on walking and it began to get dark. The man looked at my uncle, and my uncle looked at the man. The man was very scared of my uncle, and my uncle was very scared of that man. But they kept on walking, and they came to a big woods. It was getting dark. And the man looked at my uncle, and my uncle looked at the man. The man was really scared of my uncle. And my uncle was really scared of that man. But they kept on walking, and deep down into the woods they went. It was getting darker. And the man looked at my uncle, and my uncle looked at the man. The man was terrible scared of my uncle. And my uncle was terrible scared of... Ah! <laughs> I do love that this 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 thing is quite literally scary stories to tell in the dark. And it is yeah. a mixture of actually scary stories and things to just do to scare your friends when you're reading stories. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one just because of its like circle circular thing that it was mm -hmm. doing. I was just like, okay, that's great. I like that. That is very fun. Very, really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. So, uh, I'm actually going to follow where you left off and read the next one after. What do you come for? Ooh, okay. There was an old woman who lived all by herself, and she was very lonely. Sitting in the kitchen one night, she said, Oh, I wish I had some company. No sooner had she spoken than down the chimney tumbled two feet from which the flesh had rotted. The old woman's eyes bulged with terror. Then two legs dropped to the hearth and attached themselves to the feet. And then a body tumbled down, then two arms, and a man's head. As the old woman watched, the parts came together into a great gangling man. The man danced around and around the room. Faster and faster he went. And then he stopped and looked into her eyes. What do you come for? She asked in a small voice that shivered and shook. What do I come for? He said. I come for you! <laughs> and I have to add, in parentheses, as you shout the last words, stamp your foot and jump at someone nearby. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit, when I first read that last line, I read it wrong, and I read it oh. as stamp your foot and jump on someone nearby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was like, well, oh, that seems yeah, that not very great. nice. Oh, uh, that would be great to do, and like, if you were actually like at a campfire with a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it's like, hey, that right. works too. True. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this one is a personal favorite of mine. I just shared it to you, uh, Reyna. Uh, this one's called 11 Miles, also. Ow! 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 Is Thank you, so oh, no, it's, 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 it's a swan. It's a swan. Welcome back, buddy. How you doing tonight? Um, so yeah, this is a this is 11 Miles. This is a creepypasta that uh, I read a long time ago. And here's the thing. I think you would also get, like, kind of how this one works because this one is like if you're ever in like the backwoods of somewhere and like mm -hmm. just like driving on these like roads that just seem to go on forever because mm -hmm. growing up in the boonies like i did it's like 
I could imagine the uh, doing this, like reading this creepypasta and like doing the ritual that's part of it in my in my hometown because of just how expansive yeah. everything is and how just like wooded and secluded some of like the mm -hmm. deeper neighborhoods are. Hell yeah. So, yeah, so this is 11 miles and this one is... If you attempt this challenge but fail, then who knows what will happen to you. If you finish the challenge, you will find your reward. Do you have something that you truly, relentlessly desire? Despite your state of life? Is there something that you would go completely to the end of the world to get? Well, lucky for you, there's a way to achieve what the journey can prove Wait, there's a way to achieve what the journey can prove too bothersome. Oh. Uh, so here are the rules. Do not use a vehicle too large or noticeable, as you'll need some of the cover of night to be mostly safe. Also, while any sort of car will do, you may not want to choose the most expensive or cherished vehicle. Do not drive more than 30 miles per hour. You can take your slick new black Mercedes for the drive if you're close. Um, however, you will see or feel its signs, but what the signs will be will depend on what it is you desire. For example, if you're in search of wealth, you may spot shimmers on the empty branches of trees as if they, as if they ring you through the 11 miles, leading to whatever it is you seek. Each mile will test your desire. It will always get harder. Do not open the windows when you've entered. Time has stopped, so you don't need to worry about losing the night. Though you may not notice, you're not actually in your own world anymore. Take one last moment to realize that once the first mile is mostly through the woods, with the first few miles being an exception, The, the air will turn a bit colder, in which you should turn on your heating system if the vehicle has one. You won't want to take your eyes off the road later. Take some time to calm any uneasiness by admiring some of the night sky. You'll see it completely lined with stars. And you'll realize that the vehicle's headlights will no longer be required. Restrain yourself from gazing at it, though. If you look at its light for even more than a few seconds, the road in front of you will end, drawing your vehicle into the water in which you will freeze in mere minutes. The voices will be gone for this mile, but don't rejoice yet. They will be back. So, on the first mile, if it gets really cold, turn your heater on. On the second mile, if you still haven't turned the heater on, you should do it now. If you decide not to turn it on, you may regret it later. On the third mile, ignore any silhouettes that you may see in the trees. No matter how human they seem, keep your eyes on the road. On the fourth mile, you may hear voices whispering in your ear. Ignore them no matter how human they may seem. On the fifth mile, if the trees vanish, I, there may be a random appearance of a lake, and the moon starts. Ignore them at all costs. On the sixth mile, take into account that you are more than halfway done. Despite the progress, you may lose hope here. The stars will have disappeared at this point leaving the sky an empty, black abyss. The clearing will have ended, leading you back into the woods. The only light you'll be provided is with is, with is by your vehicle's headlights. But they will flicker from time to time, even if you're sure they're in perfect working order. If you have a radio in the vehicle, it will turn on here automatically. If you didn't turn it off beforehand, it will produce an overwhelming screech that will send you off the path. 
calm voice will then begin to speak about your greatest fears. What it is you are horrified of, life. It will speak in a way that will cause you to visualize the words in your mind. So don't listen to it. If you begin to comprehend what it's saying, the horrors will prove too much to stay on the road. On the seventh mile, you may hear voices again. No matter how close they may sound, ignore them at all costs. If the voices are coming from the back seat, do not turn around. Just keep ignoring and focus your eyes on the road. On the eighth mile, slow down, but do not stop. If your headlights flicker, slow down, but don't stop. If it gets really cold, do not stop. You see, hear anything, ignore them and keep driving. On the ninth mile, your vehicle will stall temporarily. Close your eyes and try to restart your vehicle. No matter what, do not open your eyes. Even if you hear anything telling you to open your eyes, just ignore them and your eyes closed. When your vehicle starts, drive as fast as you can to the next mile with your eyes closed. When that mile is over, and you will know when the mile is over, you may open your eyes. On the 10th mile, the voices of the beings will stop. If you were to look in your rear view mirror, do not have to do this, you will see them following and are impressed that you have come a long way on the journey what you desire because you are most likely going to your death. On the 11th and final mile, your vehicle may lose power but continue to move. If you see a red light ahead, close your eyes tight. Cover them if you must. Cover your ears if you're able. You will hear unrelenting and inconceivable noises from all directions. No amount of bravery and conditioning will spare you from these sounds. You will feel things touching you. The cold will turn to a merciless heat, burning all parts of the vehicle. You will feel the illusion of the flesh being burned off your bones. But no matter what, do not look. Once the power returns, stop your vehicle. Open your eyes, take a deep breath, and continue driving. Keep driving until your vehicle arrives at a dead end. Stop here, and don't attempt to move again. Nothing will happen once you reach this point. You may realize that you are back where you first began. This may confuse you, but know that you are finished. Your task is done. Close your eyes and in your deepest desire. Even if it has changed from when the journey began, imagine not desire, but possessing it. Open your eyes and you will find what you desire. So now that that task is done, what's the catch? Is your vehicle cursed? Is there something you're about to lose? Is your death imminent? The answer to all is no. Of course, you've done the challenge. You've proven worthy of what you desire. As you as stated before, the sounds of the 11th mile will continue to exist in your mind, potentially causing you some vivid and unusual nightmares. But these should prove as nothing compared to what you've gained. I think that's a different version from the one that I read because the one I read it sets up the ritual a little bit more. Because it sets it up I as like I know the one that you mean. Because um yeah, there's another one as well that follows like a similar concept. The other thing that this kind of reminds me of. Did you ever read the Left Right game? Uh, yes, I think I did. Yeah, I feel like same vibes. Same vibes in this mm -hmm. one where it's like you have to keep uh going left and right every time that you take a turn, and you cannot have anything stop you. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, and like I said, the way the the way the one that I'm thinking of is like how it sets up the story is like just like going to the backwoods of your town, just and just and you'll find the road. You'll know when you find it when you come across it, and you just start going down. And it's it, the, yeah, for uh, I don't know, I don't know uh, where that one is, but that one it could that be version that you had I, an edited oh. version of it or something like that, or they mm -hmm. updated it. Yeah, well, that one's really good. Very cool. Uh, fuck, this would make me want to redeem, or to narrate redeem parts of my book. 
Yeah, sorry, Bruggy. This is uh, this is for spooky stories. So. Yeah, no. When it comes to stuff like this, it's always really fun. Um, mm -hmm. um all right, I got one that's uh, another classic uh, from the early creepy pasta days. Um, it is one that I remember hearing uh, at the very least like ten years ago. Um, it was uh, posted September nineteenth of twenty twelve. Oh wow! Yeah, no, that's a long time ago. Damn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we're talking like early days, uh, mm -hmm. like creepy pasta and stuff like that. Which honestly is kind of like one of my favorite eras of creepy pasta and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like twenty twelve. I don't, look. All of us thought the world was going to come to an end in twenty twelve. Uh, for those yeah. of us that were old enough to remember. Um, and then we all felt like 2016 was our comeuppance due to surviving 2012 because yep. 2016 for some reason <laughs> fucking sucked. Yeah. And, and um, there's something about like the early like internet, like of like 2010s, like lit or like late 2000s, early 2010s. There's still something about the internet. Well, like when you, when you got those creepy pastas that they still felt kind of real in a sense. Right. Cause it new. like, and yeah, it, felt, it like, felt new. It was like, um, it creepy pastas when we were younger. I'm talking like at the very least 10 years ago. So early 20s, um, into like late teens when you were old mm -hmm. enough to be scared of real things, but mm -hmm. still young enough to still sometimes be a little scared of the dark. Exactly. Um, yeah. That whole space. Honestly, what that was the that was the time when I was like. I was the most confident and the most terrified because yeah. you're also just becoming an adult. You're becoming yeah. all these things and all of these real world weights are coming on to you and you're like, oh God. Not to mention mm -hmm. uh, a lot of horror during that time was hitting its its peak because mm -hmm. you had a lot of really early on um, like video games and stuff like that. They were starting to do more stuff with like Unreal Engine. Uh, mm -hmm. They were putting more effort into uh, the stories and stuff like that themselves, you could feel the weight of it more. And yeah, the old, Grimlock got it. The the older you get, the more serious the reasons for you to be afraid of the dark. Yeah. Yeah. And we started consuming more like horror media when you turn like 18 plus becomes so much more readily available to you mm -hmm. that it's like the world has given you more reasons to fear. Also, wrong yeah. type of hero. Trick or treat. I can hey. give you. All right, uh, I got I got lemon lollipops, um, Werther's originals, uh, caramel pumpkins. What what one would you like? If you're wearing a really good costume, I can give you one of each. There you go. Yeah, that would What's be great. What's your costume, and I'll and we'll we'll see if you get one of each. Ooh, Hell lemon yeah. lollipop. All right, you can definitely stay. Here you go. Enjoy your lemon lollipop. <laughs> right, I'm gonna just I'm gonna just huck it at you through the screen. <laughs> Okay. Whack. Um, <laughs> Whack. <laughs> but yeah, on that whole thing of like of horror felt feeling real, there was one that there was one creepy pasta, and I know as silly as it sounds, it was the Squidward is dead or like SpongeBob is dead oh, one. I can't remember. Yeah, that squid Squidward uh, uh Squidward S word that they get mad about on TikTok. Um Yeah, yeah. Yeah, also, yeah um yeah. Uh, also, uh, welcome to the crew. Uh, wrong type hero. Grab yourself a pint. Have a seat. Join the Seamus adventure. I keep I keep the jumbo sized lemon lollipops in the galley behind the second barrel to the left. Go hey. ahead, homie. Um, Hell yeah. Yeah. Oh Squid God damn it, Alex. Squid yeah. Squidward super slide. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and that like that one like the way like the way it was presented was like. Wait, like, like, and like the way it ends too is just like, wait, is this like a legit a thing that happened? Because it like it feels like legit a thing that could happen, mm -hmm. especially nowadays with the type of stuff that is when you realize this type of stuff is actually on the internet, yeah. like in some deep dark corner of it. That's like the scary shit of it. Well, I mean, that's like that was like the birthing of like uh, Ben drowned. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what was it, Cri Crystal Cove? Um... Yeah, and Crystal like a Cove. couple of other, yeah, and like um, other stuff like that. Uh, going through recommended uh, VTuber streams and seeing if streams actually will give me candy. And uh, congrats, you passed hey. Candle Cove. That's it. Um, uh, by Chris Straub. Yes, and uh, 
Yeah, well, hey, glad to have you here, homie. I mean, I am dressed in costume, so. <laughs> I'd be kind of weird if I didn't have candy hiding around here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I've got a bunch of Mexican candy, so. It's really good. If you're it's interested really in that. Good, though. Um, yeah. Also, yeah. Uh, really quick, the Swedish scribe redeemed Say the Thing, and I gotta say the thing now. Do it. Oh, God damn it. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> uh, uh, Sasha! Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, for trick or treat, what kind of candy do you want? Do you want Werther's Original, Lemon Lollipops, uh, Caramel Pumpkins, or I think I might even have a tiny bag of gummy sharks if you're interested and that's not too hey. terrible for you. <laughs> How's it going, Sasha? Also, I've heard... Okay, this is the second time someone su suggested Local 58. I'm going to have to look them up now because I'm really curious. I could hear analog the, the, horror at 476 yeah. millihertz or megahertz. Hey. Ooh. Okay. I might have to go check this out. That actually seems really fun. Local 58 TV Nightwalk. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna have to check this out. Ooh. Ooh. I feel like this would be like right up like Stacy's alley as well. Yeah. Also, gummy sharks. It is. There you go. The Russian sleep Hell experiment. Yeah. I actually, ironically enough, that is one of the stories I have pulled up because I love that story. That one's really good. There's another one that's very similar to that. I can't remember the name of it, but basically it had to do with like another experiment where they um where they basically like cut all like nerve endings. Yes, or, like, oh, really uh, where they saw God. Yes, yes. Yes, that I know one. exactly yeah, the one you one. mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one is fucking freaky because yeah, what happens like what would happen if you just decide to turn everything off and like oh that's horrifying so um talking about like uh analog horror and things like that one of the other things that came about in like early 2010s to um like mid 2000s was the slender man era where yeah. um a bunch of like really really good media was made around them and stuff like that mm -hmm. and one of my favorites was uh tribe tribe 12 Mm -hmm. and everyman hybrid i used to follow them a lot and um there was a third one that is fucking escaping me right now uh and i'm so mad at myself because i used to watch these religiously because the thing is they did such a good job of not and this was like marble hornets thank you yeah that was, that was a really popular one yeah. that one's yeah, that really the, good yeah marble hornets is the really popular one that really kicked things off but tribe 12 <laughs> and everyman hybrid were uh, the ones I initially watched around because every man hybrid when it starts tries to portend itself as a fitness channel. Oh, um, and I then love that. the creepy shit starts happening afterwards. Oh, damn, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, same goes for Tribe Twelve. Tribe Twelve is uh, he was making a uh, uh, he was doing a video uh, documentary for a class project, um, and it turned into him discovering this thing. And oh wow. Oh, it was so good. I used to eat that shit up at two in the morning and I oh. did not sleep. Um, Cause yeah, the thing is, this right. is also early enough on that it was really hard for like YouTubers to create that um, like low budget vibe uh, combined with like, without with using practical effects rather than um, like CGI. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and, yeah. Oh, it added a grittiness that I fucking loved. Yeah, because like nowadays it's like it's so it's so easy to tell when it's like CGI, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's it, it just doesn't sit well. Um, yeah, it just it but, doesn't look right, especially that era. Like it, it looks mm -hmm. weirdly chunky. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, speaking of just another analog horror, uh, uh, Sally had me check this out the other night, but Vale Verde. Uh, is really good, like, video game analog horror. Like, that shit freaked me the fuck out when, uh, when Sully had me watch, like, the first part of it. Ooh, I'll have to get you to, to DM me that, because I'm really curious. I am Will now, do, yeah. uh, I have now pulled up, I have three separate tabs that has Local 58, Nightmind, and Post Content, uh, hey. for me to check out, because I, I want to see that shit so good. Um, cause I love stuff that's like lost games, forgotten stories and stuff like yeah. that. That's, that, that shit is my bread and butter. I love that stuff so much. Um, I actually want to do a cryptid dive at some point with a uh, tome at one point or another. Cause, uh, we were talking about it since it would be really funny for me to do a cryptid dive with the Mothman. 
Oh yeah, no, that would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love I love cryptid stuff too. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else saw this. I'm pretty sure like most people like around my age probably did. But who remembers the the uh, the show Lost Tapes that Animal Ooh. Planet used to have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I just yeah. a big ass swig of cider when you said that. But yes, yes, I do remember that. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, no. Uh, I was uh, I I rediscovered that, and I I remember exactly why that show freaked me the fuck out when I was a uh, when I was a wee lad. Mm -hmm. Oh man, one of these days I'm gonna write a cosmic horror story for y'all uh, because I'm really good at it. Do it, Bruggy. Do it. Oh fuck yeah, fuck yeah. Uh, like co cosmic horror. Uh, the thing that I really like, the thing that really got me back when I was a uh, when I was in my young years, is stuff like. Uh, artifacts and objects turning into beings or like being entity like holders and mm -hmm. um, the other thing that always used to get me things like the Russian sleep experiment the thing that's mm -hmm. the, the most terrifying in it for me is the fact that it wouldn't be beyond the scope of the human mind to do something so horrific to their fellow man exactly yeah and it's um, awful but great mm -hmm. but terrible <laughs> And, and it reminds me of this one, um, uh, there's this one YouTube channel that I still watch recently uh, called Bedtime Stories. And there's one that they cover that is like, it's called Celes Neus Rathaus. And it's like, apparently like this German like town hall um, in the town of Sele. Um, and uh, the Germans were there during World War II doing German World War II things, <laughs> weird magic things that they were doing mm -hmm. apparently when the allies were invading germany they flooded the basement and then sealed off the basement with uh or no before they could or they no they just flooded the basement and then when people when the when the allies arrived uh apparently there's some creepy fucking shit down there and this this like town hall is still notoriously haunted to this day uh because of Nazi magic, according to you know the stories, and it's ooh, mm. and it's um, just like when dude, that kind of stuff is so free. Oh god, right? It's the the fact of like just unexplained phenomena in your real mm. life is is fucking yeah. terrifying, but so cool at the same time. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, hero, I have uh, people have suggested home safety hotline to me, and I really do need to check it out. Uh, I also am planning to read more Warhammer 40k stuff at some point in the future. Um, I am well, I'm looking to actually... Uh, so, uh, Tome's actually requested that I read something from 40k in my Jennifer Coolidge voice. Oh, yes! Yes! <laughs> I hope you guys are ready for the Imperial Army and the, the Emperor. All hail to the Emperor. Oh my god, that's great. Blood for the blood god. But yeah, no, um... um... <laughs> god, I just remember reading through Dead and Horny with that, and it's so great. Mm -hmm. I love it. Oh, it's oh, gonna be so god. good. Oh. <laughs> It'll make you want a hot dog real bad. But yeah, so, um... <laughs> Um, yeah, no, oh. I, I've already promised Tome, uh, it was, it was a promise I made when we met up at TwitchCon. Uh, I was like, give me something to read in the Jennifer Coolidge voice that's from 40k and I will do it. And they're like, bet. So <laughs> I have to, I have to read that. That's honestly, that's probably going to be one of the first things I read with the new mic set up <laughs> when I get that's the opportunity. Great. I got to do it. Oh, I got to do it in full keel. Um, with that voice. But uh, we were talking scary stories, and uh, you know what? Um, since we're talking about stuff that's happened in the real life and whatnot. Um, also, yes, it is, in fact, now the 1st of November. No, it is not Merry Christmas. It's not finished being Halloween until I've gone to sleep. Um, yeah, yeah, and also, for me, <laughs> it doesn't start being Christmas until after Dia de los Muertos. So I was going to say, Christmas after Dia de los Muertos, and also after uh, uh, Remembrance Day in Canada for me. Oh, there you go, yeah. See, yeah, here's the thing. So I do not. I don't give Christmas any attention until after Thanksgiving for us. Yeah, no, and that's totally fair. So, uh, in that case, um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, wrong. Uh, or t hero. Um, 
if you want to link something, I really do appreciate it. Feel free to DM that to me either on Blue Sky or if you're in the Virtual Vibes Discord or something like that, feel free to hit me up there. Uh, throw the links there. Uh, I don't have links uh, active in my chat because there was an is uh, a, a situation that happened a while back, and I'm like, ha no, never again. Um, no, that's fair. Yeah. It only takes uh, one. it only takes one to ruin the whole situation. Once bitten, twice shy, baby. Um, yep. But yeah. So, speaking of uh, IRL situations and true time horror stories and all that good stuff, um, I, in fact, instead of reading a story from the internet, I'm actually going to share a, a scary story of my own. Oh, let's see. So I was about 14 years old, maybe 13. I'd only just recently entered my teens, and as you do when you're teenagers, uh, you enter high school. You go through your rites of passage, you go through your scary challenges, things that show just how brave you are to your friends, especially if they're new friends that happen to be slightly older kids from the high school you're now going to. It's one of those things that's super, super important as you're growing up. So me and a group of friends, a couple people I knew from elementary school going into high school and then also like new high school friends. Uh, all were walking out to this old schoolyard. Uh, it was sometime around, I want to say one in the morning. Now, remember, this is during a time when our parents were like pretty okay with us kind of wandering around that late at night, especially if yeah. they had a group of friends and at least one of them that your mom knew. Uh, mm -hmm. You could kind of get away with it. So it was this old church house that was also a school. It was one of those uh, like kind of Christian like Sunday school kind of deals. Um but it had been closed for years, and no one really knew why. At least, we didn't. But we thought, oh, well, there's been lots of scary stories connected to this place. What if we walked around that place late at night to see what would happen? And as we were walking around these yards, uh, uh, walking around the old basketball court and stuff like that, and swapping scary stories from uh, ghosts and old nuns haunting the halls, the sounds of children's laughter tinkling on the wind, uh, old priests who are probably writhing in hell, all that stuff that was stuff that we were talking to each other. We happened to look off to the side, and I remember really distinctly uh, we were joking and trying to throw rocks through the uh, we were trying to throw rocks through the basketball hoop. And <laughs> I looked off to the side. And in one of the windows of the building, a light turned on for just a second, and there was a person standing there watching us. And then it was out. I, wow. trying to be brave, uh, gestured to my friends like, hey, did you guys see something up there? And we're like, what are you talking about? And it's like, I, I thought I saw something up there. And they're like, oh, oh, rain is already getting spooked every it's, it's, it's like no 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 it's for real like I, I i think there was something up there maybe a security guard or something because you know it's not out of the norm abandoned buildings aren't always actually abandoned sometimes there's a security guard hiding around and then they hear a bunch of teenagers being teenagers so they, you know they go and see what's up maybe what i saw was a flashlight no idea so i get dared to walk up the steps of the of the church building and to try to open the door now, this door has one of those, like, old locks on it, and it made me realize there couldn't have been someone inside. These doors were very sufficiently locked. Uh oh And one of the doors had so much rust on it, you could barely even move it. Oh. I, you know, was trying to be brave, and I'm laughing it off with my friends, and I'm like, ha ha, yeah, no, it's probably nothing. It's probably nothing. Probably and nothing. I... I leaned against the door, I hear it creak, and then I actually hear something. Oh. It's like the sound a boot makes when it walks over gravel. Now, I can see oh. all of my friends that I've shown up with. I can see <laughs> all of the people I'm supposed to be here with, and none of them are moving when I hear that sound. And as I continue oh. leaning on the door, I have this moment of, huh, that's not good. And then I hear really faintly and it sounds like it's coming from inside it sounds like a child crying oh and I, no. I backed the fuck off that door so fast and I remember I scrabbled down the steps and I'm like yeah no there was nobody there it's fine um 
hey, let's walk over to this other spot uh, that's not right next to this building. So I'm, I'm pretty shaken up. A friend of mine who knows that I don't shake very easily, uh, even at that age, uh, is like, are, are you good? And I'm like, I don't think we should be here. Like, I, I really don't think we should be here. Mm -hmm. um, and so a couple of our friends continue, like, trying to, you know, throw rocks through the basketball hoop. And they're going a little bit further into the outskirts of, like, where the flat top is to get some of the better mm -hmm. chunkier rocks. And then one of them stops and then drops it and takes like five really quick steps back. And we're like, what? Did you see like a bug or something? He's like, that's not a rock. Like, what do you, what uh, do you mean? What? He's, like, he's like, well, it, it's it's a rock, but it's it's not a rock. And we're like, what do you mean it's not a rock? What, the, what are you talking about? Uh. And we walk over and one of the older kids that actually had a cell phone takes out their phone and turns on the flashlight it's a chunk of stone but it's weirdly smooth and flat on two sides and there's markings in it oh this stone was from a grave marker it wasn't oh. just a standard rock from your regular everyday construction work or your random side gravel pavement it was a chunk of a headstone Oh, no. And we fucking just went, nope. And just all of us, like, the moment we saw that, we were like, nope, nope, nope. We're leaving. Nope. Bye-bye. Yeah, and yeah. we fucking hoofed it. It wasn't That's until fair. a few years later when I had access to the internet, um, because I did not get that early on in my youth. Uh, mm -hmm. When I got access to the internet, I looked up, like, I don't remember the name of the school, but it was essentially an old parish uh, that had been turned into a Christian school and youth center, um, but had been shut down for years. I looked it up, and it turns out the reason that place had been shut down is because children had started to go missing. And Aww. they found out that uh, none of those kids have been found. There's no bodies to be spoken of, but... They also dug up when they were looking into where the kids had gone missing, because all of these kids had gone to the school, that when they had built this establishment, when they'd built this building, they'd actually done it over top of a graveyard. They had essentially bought the rights to the land, they bought out the families, and they bulldozed over the graves. Why do you, why do people do that? Like, so, I thought that was just a thing. Nope. So some of the gravel was actually bits of crumbled and crushed gravestones. Oh, no. And for years, uh, students and teachers alike would constantly state that something felt off about the school. Until mm -hmm. finally, after the fifth child went missing, the school fully closed its doors. Yeah, that's that is something that I uh, that. Yeah, that you would do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Never oh, went back. Man. And that place has mm -hmm. since been torn down, uh, as far Good. as I know. Uh, they now just have it as a lot that people can't go and, like, do anything with. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, I guess since you're sharing some some creepy stuff from your own, uh, from your own experience, I'm gonna go ahead and do the same. Awesome. Also, I just delayed my, uh, uh, ad break, so it should happen a little closer to yours now. Cool. Um, the, these, uh, these incidences have, are short. They're very, uh, uh, they're not like super long, but, um, so, uh, I tried to move out with some friends back, uh, back before COVID happened. Um, and, uh, at, at, at a certain point I started like feeling weird. Also, I look good in birth. Interesting. Um, you do. You got that. You got that drow vibe. <laughs> I know. That's good. Um, <laughs> but I started getting like this weird feeling. Like the the townhouse that we were in had like this weird, like creepy, like closet where it uh, that just kind of like went further into the wall than it really should have. And and as time went on, I just kind of like felt more and more off. Mind you, my roommates were not the best roommates, but still, it was not the it was not the most like 
clean situation, like uh, as a as, or I guess like the best feeling situation outside of that. It's like there was just something weird going on, and I could just. And one night I'm going to bed, and I I don't like sleeping with like the closets open or anything like that because I always just feel like it's weird to look into a black void if you're like half asleep. So I closed my closet door as I always do. Um, and I made sure it was closed after I took care of stuff and I go to bed and I, and you know, I fall asleep after a little bit and then I wake up and I, and I am looking towards the wall at first. And then I flip over to look at the to switch sides and look over at the closet. The closet door is open. The moment I see that. My fucking blood runs cold. I freeze. And I'm like, what the fuck? I don't know if I said this out loud or what. I, I, I can't really remember. But then this shadow, like, does a fucking jump scare on me. And it says in, like, this voice that sounds like a, like a small child saying, I found you. And I am like, the fuck? What? And I am frozen. And I don't know when I fall back to, to sleep. But I am, but like, at some point I, I fall back asleep and I wake up and the closet is still open. And I'm like, fuck no. That, that did Ooh, not just happen. No, no, no. And Ooh. yeah, no, it is, it is, really freaked me the fuck out. And this is again this is not the only like weird shit that's happened to me cuz weird shit happens all over where I live uh it's really fucking weird because another time this is when I have already moved back home and I've gotten my dog uh Demi Demi is a big old mastiff she needs to go for her walks um uh when she was living inside with me mm -hmm. so I I would have to take Demi out on night walks sometimes because I would just get home late and all this other kinds of stuff. And I I walk Demi and at first I notice an owl. And I and I hear the owl hooting. And I'm like, oh okay. That's that's weird. I don't really see owls all that often here. Okay, weird. And uh I and I always train Demi as I'm as I'm walking her, like teaching her to heal, to stay, all that kind of stuff. And as we are sort of rounding her sort of usual corner where she does her business, I hear as as Demi is finishing, good girl, in my sister's voice. And this just and this happened just after my sister had come back from the UK and then went back to the UK. So this was sometime in like August or yeah. September or something like that. And I am like, the fuck what? And I looked around and I see nobody. There is there's nobody outside watering their plants or anything. It's dark as fuck. I don't see anybody with a flashlight that's like come up behind us. And I look around. I'm like, what the fuck was that? And I hear it again. It's like, good girl in my sister's voice. And I am like, hijo de su puta madre. Fuck no. We <laughs> ran. I I ran as fast as I could. Demi ran right with me. Uh, I said, fuck no to that. Fuck no to that. And then here uh, I do a little bit of research. Uh, I find out that in uh, in a lot of Mesoamerican and Native American lore, owls are signs of evil. They're one of the many forms for the for the skinny boys as well. If you guys know what the skinny boys are, I'm not going to actually say their name because you're not supposed to talk about them. But mm -hmm. yeah, those yeah those assholes. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, I said no to that. I said fuck no to that because th that was really fucking scary as well and I, I i try not to walk out in the middle or i try not to walk around dusk anymore because that is so fucking like scary to deal with um so and whenever funny. i hear an owl i'm like fuck you you demon bastards get the fuck off my land that's a funny thing is like um like oh i Owls are seen as, like, wise and cool and interesting uh, creatures mm. uh, in so many other cultures, whereas in others they're like, no, these things are fucking ill omens. Yeah, no, they are They are ill omens for a lot of, like, Native American tribes. Um, and it's, yeah. I didn't know it, that. Yeah. Um, 
for here in this specific area, uh, we well, the, the native tribes, especially like the Mexica and the Yaki and all that stuff, the people here, while they don't use the same word as like the Navajo or the Dine use that word, mm-hmm. we have some, again, we have something similar. We we call them Nagual, but like Nagual is, is a little bit more complicated because it's because it, Nagual is also like sort of your uh, spirit animal in a sense. It is your, or it's, okay. it is the, or it is also like part of the symbol that you were associated with in the Mesoamerican oh. like zodiac system and all that kind of stuff. It's sort of like your alter okay. ego. Um, gotcha. Okay. Uh, and in, that, in, that, in that sense, though, but like, you know, they're also like, if you're trained in that, if you're, uh, if because it's like shamanistic kind of stuff too, mm-hmm. uh, you are trained to do that. Uh, you know, you got to be trained appropriately, and that's mm. that's the thing. It's like that's why, like here, like you, hearing voices out of nowhere in the middle or like at dusk, and when there's owls about, yeah, no, that stuff like sent chills down my blood when I realized what I was uh, what I was uh, oh, what was going on. Creepy. Yeah. Oh, that's very uh, cool though. Yeah. Also, I have I add starting in about three seconds here. Gotcha. How about um. You? Uh, ads just started on my end. Nice. All right, we we have managed to sync them up, so we can take our break hey. at roughly the same time. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will say, I'll during the ad break, I'll I'll share this very very short story because it's more stupid than funny than it is uh bad. Um. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. So. Uh, this is from like my childhood, and it was really funny to me, uh, <laughs> because I barely remember it. But for my mom, it was fucking terrifying. Uh, so uh, I read a story earlier called Mr. Widemouth. Um, and it oh. made mention of a certain very popular uh, toy from the mm-hmm. uh, late 90s. Slash early 2000s. Furbies. Yep. Um, so I had a Furby, obviously, as a child, as most uh, in our... Uh, as, as most of the children in my youth, um, they, like, most people would have some variant of Furby or some something of that ilk. Uh, I'm actually hoping to one day make myself a long Furby, because um, I think it would be funny. Um, yeah. So, croissants, don't bully. Don't do that. Yeah, I was just about to say, uh, uh, croissants, um, about about what you're trying to like point out there, um, uh for the Wendigo, those those are that's another indigenous term that's often being really misused by media. Mm-hmm. While it's not yeah. really sort of forbidden to talk about those, um, they're just they're mainly an allegory for like greed and stuff like that. But still, like, yeah. kind of be respectful for like for First Nations and Native American like traditions. When yeah. we say we don't want to talk about something, you don't talk about it. Yeah. Also, when, if someone is actively showing a discomfort or a, a, like a desire to not be spoken to or of a certain way, please be respectful. Don't do it. Otherwise, you're earning yourself a very quick trip to the town back corner. Yeah. Um, and it's like I said before, with the, with the Navajo, the Dine people specifically, they've mm-hmm. specifically asked people to stop talking about these things be- because, again, it's, it's something that in their culture you want to respect. You yeah. respect, uh, you respect, because, you know, it's all part of, like, their beliefs and all that kind of stuff. Sure, they might be afraid of it, but it's also they respect these things because it is part of their culture. So, yeah. please, please be respectful. Exactly. And, like, uh, if, whether you meant nothing bad or whatnot, you need to respect the words that are being said now. Please be mindful. Don't be a dink. And remember, your words, even without the intent, can have uh, impact. Mm-hmm. Uh, anywho, Herbie's. So, Evil Furby. Uh, I had Furby, uh, much appreciated croissants. Uh, so I had a Furby growing up. Um, and you know how electronics, uh, when the battery starts to die, uh, they start to like fade and wind down and they sound mm-hmm. weird. They like down pitch and everything too. Yeah. They get all warped and like, oh. yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> just it, honestly fucking funny when you're dealing with it, unless it's uh, at this current situation, which happened to my mom. <laughs> so I was like half asleep and uh, my mom had uh, like, I asked my mom to move the Furby because I didn't like where it was. Cause I, I had it up on a shelf and it was like mm-hmm. staring down at me. I was like, oh. I don't like that. Can we move it? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I'll move it for you. Um, 
She got in front of it. Now, the Furby wasn't supposed to be on at this point. Keep this in mind. The Furby was not meant to be on. It was supposed to have been turned off. Its little eyes open up. Oh, no. And go, and in its distorted, dying battery voice goes, Me hungry. <laughs> and my mom's oh. like, Nope. <laughs> and she like grabs it, oh, yanked the batteries horrifying. out, and threw it in the back of a closet. <laughs> Oh my god, that's horrifying. That's great. I love that. <laughs> oh my and god, like, that's great. Me as a kid, I'm like, haha, funny, funny. My my Furby's hungry. Uh, my my Furby wants a midnight snack. My mom's like, demon toy, <laughs> demon toy. Throw it in the closet. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Oh. I I got I got another like that. I got one that's sort of like that same sort of vibe. That's it's really funny as a story, but, like, when you're mm -hmm. in that situation, it's fucking terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, so, me and my buddies, once, we were getting together for 4th of July, we were gonna go to, uh, we're gonna go to a convention or something. And mm -hmm. so, we're, and, like, I'm still in high school, uh, my buddies are, like, in college, and, but they're, like, down, they're down back at home for the, for the weekend, or, or for the summer, or whatever. And so we're all getting together. We we go to my my friend's house, which is like in like the backwoods part of where I live. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that happens is the car that we're supposed to go in get gets a flat tire. Oh, and we're like, good start. oh, come on, yeah. And so we had to, and we couldn't get it off until until my friend's dad shows up, grabs a two by four, whacks it, and takes it off the rim, and we're able to replace the tire. Mm -hmm. Here's where the here's where the spooky shit happens though. Once we get everything sorted out, it's it's nice and dark. Oh boy. And we when uh so bef so where my friend lives, you have to like drive like about like 5 miles or something like that to get to the road that then takes you onto the onto the interstate. Mm -hmm. So, uh we we are a free or an open range community. The ranchers can have their cows wander around and all that kinds of good stuff. Well, shouldn't probably surprise you that people hit cows on a regular basis. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, as we're as we're you know, ro like heading down, we're going a lot faster than we should. We hit a cow. We hit a baby cow, and we and we, so we have to we have to roll off to the road because the fucking car's totaled. Um. And we and I tell so while my while my friend is calling the cops because you need to report that you hit a you hit a ranch uh, like a a ranch animal right yeah and so he's calling the cops and in the meanwhile I tell my other friend like hey let's go get the cow's body off the road uh, it was a, it was a calf so we you know let's just do it and so yeah we uh, we go and we're looking around it's like we did not like drive that far off from where we hit this fucking thing where is it. And we're looking around, and it's like, where is it? And then my friend flashes up, like, the, the, the cell phone flashlight. He pans it up, and we see not one, not two. We see the whole fucking herd staring at us with oh, no. what I can only say is blind, impotent rage. Uh, I tell my friend, fuck it, run fucking run i like tap him on the leg and yeah. we fucking we fucking book it back to the car uh <laughs> because mama cow was probably pissed that we might have killed her her baby killed her calf yeah yeah um oh, though boy. To, yeah though to be fair well i don't think we killed it because by the time the cop showed up the cop was like i don't know what like the cows are gone I didn't see a I didn't see a baby cow on the road, so I think you're okay. And he just basically said, it, "I don't see a cow. You don't see a cow, so we can just all go home. <laughs> just we can all just go home." And he just he just <laughs> took all our statements. We got picked up by another friend of ours, and then we went we we went back to uh we went back to their place. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. No, That's that, awful. that was terrible yeah oh oh man fucking spooky shit nope yeah yep also, cows are cute as hell until it's nighttime and then they're fucking terrifying 
Yeah, and then when you have like a flashlight shining in their eyes, so all their eyes are glowing at they're you. Just yeah, glowing no, at, a... yeah, no, there's just like these moon shaped discs just staring at you. I'm like, Neh. yeah. And the mm-hmm. fact that it was like, you know, a couple dozen cows staring you down, I'm like, oh, fuck no. Yeah, no thanks. Oh, man. Yeah, no thanks. Eh, yikes, yeah. yikes, 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 yikes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So I saw you mention uh, that you're probably going to only go for another, like, maybe hour or so. Is that about right? Uh, that's, yeah, that's about right. Uh, I th- I'm thinking about that time, yeah. Okay, okay. So um, uh, do you have a link to this person's Twitch? I'm not sure I'm following. Oh, you're talking about Caleb? Yeah, of course. I even have a hotkey for him because he's awesome. E- thank you. I have a Caleb command because he's cool like that. I need to do a, I need to do a homie homies command for, like, for you I need and, to update you know, my homies commands so bad. I'm so Whoa. far behind. I feel so bad. Hey. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Every time, especially because like one of my mods, Vin, I don't have <laughs> a button for him yet. But Whoa. it's really funny because I then tell him to shout himself out. Hey. Because I'm like, you're not getting away from this. Just because I don't have a button exactly. for you doesn't mean you're not getting away from this. Hey. Blitzmaster, thank you so much for the follow. Sasha, thank you so much for the follow. I greatly appreciate you guys. Welcome to the Royal Archives. I hope you guys enjoy your stay. Uh, yeah. Remember, don't crease the corners of the page. Ask for a bookmark. Exactly. Oh, speaking of bookmark, Reina actually had a really good idea, and I, I, I plan on going through this. You through want to know this it's when I. Funny? What's Literally up? Literally the day after I gave you that suggestion, Vograce has started making uh, that as an option for things oh. you can get. I, Damn, it's nice. The fucking timing. I'm I'm the omniscient mouse, I swear to God. <laughs> Paige, thank you so much for the follow. I greatly appreciate you, buddy. Welcome on in. Uh, but yeah, Reyna came up with this really good idea of having my business cards as a VTuber be bookmarks. Uh, so one side would be like a docky, like safer work docky art, and then the other side would be like my QR code uh, or, you know, my socials and all that kind of stuff. And then it would have uh, I would add a tassel to it, uh, like Reina suggested, uh, mm-hmm. in red, black, and gold. Um, and so yeah, so yeah, when I when I get the chance, uh, we're gonna get bookmarker. I'm so glad you like that idea. <laughs> yeah, it's such a good idea. I love it, and I'm I'm so dumb that I even, didn't even think about it until you mentioned it. I'm like, oh shit, those would be perfect. So straight so. up, um, it's become a running joke amongst my friends and I now that I'm the mm-hmm. ideas mouse. Uh, hey. that I'm really bad at implementing ideas of my own for myself when mm-hmm. I'm like, I'll, I'll, I'll think of a bunch of really cool ideas. In fact, there's a, a collaborative stream I wish to do with you sometime in the near future. Um, mm-hmm. That is, uh, I want to do a tier. I, I'm bringing back tier lists, baby. Uh, hey. for, uh, but specifically it's what book genre would you be? Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I, I have this as an idea of a, I'm going to have a bunch of people submit their PNGs, and uh, they are only allowed to give me five words to describe their character, and I have to place what kind of uh, what kind of book genre I think they'd be. Gotcha. And I wanted to bring uh, you, Comic, and Keystar, all uh, lore, archive, and book-focused people in on it with me to give your educated opinions on what their keywords tell me about their story and where you think they'd land. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, no, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, so I thought that would be kind of fun. And uh, I, I love I love bringing homies together. And I don't know if I've ever stuck the three of you in the room together. And so I think that would be a good time. <laughs> yeah, no, I think of, of the homies that I've, I've had a chance and pleasure to hang out with, obviously Crimson. Um, Crimson's love. Uh, let me... See, I think I'm gonna blank it. I think. Um, oh man, like, yeah, I know I I've had you in like collab spaces together, like where we've all been yeah. hanging out just like in a general call. But like, mm-hmm. as an actual, no, I'm planning specifically to have all y'all in the same space at the same time, kind of thing. Um, because, um, because uh, Key's in charge of the Asturia and a uh, comic is also in control of his own archives that has every book that's ever been written, even ones with the words we're speaking right now. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I, I have I, other I, archives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yep. I think that could be really, really fun. Um, yeah. I, I also like the sort of vibe that I got, like the idea of 
that I went with when I like kind of like when I when it, that when the fuse lit in my brain about like doing wait doing the royal archives that fucking makes a lot of sense because uh -huh. like because like the whole idea behind it is like just kind of running it sort of as like a because there's there were a lot of like medieval and renaissance types of like universities that mm -hmm. were that were libraries but they were also schools and just places where people could hang out and exchange knowledge with one another um, yeah. And that's sort of my idea for it too, because it's not just books, it's not just stories. It's, not it's just also a, yeah, it's not just collecting them; it's sharing the stories. Mm -hmm. And it's also just also like uh, it's also why I can also just implement my love for like talking about martial arts and stuff like that, because it's like because these were also schools where people could train how to sword fight and all that kind of stuff. So Honestly, I decided to do that for you. Exactly. Yeah, I'm yeah, a, I'm no. a jack of all trades, master of none. But uh, it was so funny that literally the day after I talked about it with you, I get an email from Vograce that's like, October specials, new stuff for launching. And I look at one of them's a fucking bookmark and I'm like, are you goddamn kidding me? That's great. <laughs> like, I swear, honestly, I still think the idea of you just having like a standard paper bookmark actually would make the most sense just because it's one easier to print, uh, easier mm -hmm. to carry as well as quantity and whatnot. Not to mention, yeah. um, I don't always like having super chunky bookmarks. Um mm -hmm. Because I don't know about you, but I've noticed that sometimes if they're a little bit too chunky or they've got, like, edges on them in a certain way, they actually run the risk of creasing my book if it's a bit thicker. Yes, yeah. That's why they got, like, I... Where that's they, like, why crease I, the page that it's on? Mm-hmm. I always mm -hmm. prefer just the standard, like, paper bookmarks. Maybe if mm -hmm. they're, they're made out of something like... Or, some like, a ribbon type or something. Mm-hmm, exactly, yeah. Um, I, I can't do any of, the, like, the big old chunky bookmarks or anything like that because I just... They, I feel like they ruin. Or, well, no, they definitely ruin pages for. Me. So it's like, yeah, no. Yeah, it's. I only use my chunky bookmarks for thin books or stuff that I know no. is like light paperbacks and stuff like that because I know yeah. it won't damage the material inside. But hardcovers mm -hmm. or thick books will always and forever only have paper bookmarks or uh, sashes in them because I'm oh, not risking fair, yeah. wrecking my books. Yeah, um, no good idea. Mm -hmm. Speaking of stories, uh, we should probably get back into reading. Oh yeah, we should, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do have a small request, unless uh, there's something else that you would rather read uh, prior. But uh, if there is a chance to read um, mm -hmm. Tulpa, I would really love to feel ha find your feelings on it. Uh, and the book I'm about, the one I'm about to read, is really short. It's only like a six minute read. So, mm -hmm. but I would love to hear your take on Tulpa and how you feel about it because I think it's gotcha. really interesting. All right, I will. I will pull up uh, Tulpa and. And then so uh, I guess you read your your bit and I will read Tulpa afterwards. Fantastic. I will still send you the one that I am about to read. Uh, as we talked about, uh, kids' toys and things like that, uh, similar into the vein of Mr. Widemouth, uh, this oh. is Ichbar Bigelstein. Ooh. That's quite the name. From September 19th of 2012. I, Oh, this, I think this is the Creepypasta website I used to like visit all the time uh-huh this is one of the this is one of those early ones uh before yeah, the, the i think this is before the wiki got launched or the file <laughs> fandom one got launched i believe so yeah because mm -hmm. i remember right. reading this like it, when i when i was a teacher's aide in high school like just reading through <laughs> this website uh-huh <laughs> great all right so settle in for ikbar biggelstein when I was a small child, I was terrified of the dark. I still am, but back when I was around six years old, I couldn't go a full night without crying out for one of my parents to search beneath my bed or in my closet for whatever monster I thought was waiting to eat me. Even with a nightlight, I would still see dark shapes moving around the corners of the room, or strange faces looking in on me from my bedroom window. My parents would do their best to console me, telling me that it was just a bad dream or a trick of the light. But in my young mind, I was positive that the second I fell asleep, the bad things would get me. Most of the time, I would just hide under the blankets until I became tired enough to stop worrying. But every now and then, I would become so panicked that I would run screaming into my parents' room, waking up my brother and sister in the process. After an ordeal like that, there would be no way anyone would get me getting a full night's rest. Eventually, <coughs> eventually after one particularly traumatizing night, my parents had had enough. Unfortunately for them, they understood the futility of arguing with a six-year-old and knew that they would be unable to convince me to rid myself of my childish fears through reasons and logic. They had to be clever. 
It was my mother's idea to stitch together my little bedtime friend. She collected a large assortment of random pieces of fabric and her sewing machine and created what I would later refer to as Mr. Ick Barbgelstein, or Ick for short. Ick was a sock monster, as my mother called him. He was made to keep me safe while I slept at night by scaring away all the other monsters. He was pretty damn creepy, I had to admit. Honestly, looking back on it all now, I'm still impressed that my mom could think of something so strange and disturbing looking. Ikbar had the stitched together look of a Frankenstein gremlin, with big white button eyes and floppy cat ears. His little arms and legs were made from a pair of my sister's black and white striped socks, and the half of his face that was green was made from my brother's tall football socks. His head could have been described as bulbous, and for his mouth, my mom attached a piece of white fabric and sewed a zigzag pattern into the shape of a wide grin with sharp teeth. I loved him at once. From then on, Ick never left my side. So long as it was after dusk, of course. Ick didn't like the sun, and would get upset if I tried to bring him to school with me. But that was okay. I only needed him at night to keep away the boogeymen. That was what he was good at. So every night at bedtime, Ick would tell me where the monsters were hiding, and I would place him near the section of my room, clo uh, of my room closest to the spookiness. If there was something in the closet, Ick would block the door. If there was a dark creature scratching at my window, Ick would be pressed up against the glass. If there was a big hairy beast under my bed, then under the bed he went. Sometimes the monsters weren't even in my room. Sometimes they would hide in my dreams, and Ikbar would have to come with me into my nightmares. It was fun bringing Ick into my dream world, as he and I would spend hours fighting off ghouls and demons. The best part was, in my dreams, Ick could talk to me for real. How much do you love me? He would ask. More than anything, I would always tell him. One night in a dream, after I had lost my first tooth, Ick asked me for a favor. Can I have the tooth? I asked him why. To help me kill the bad things, he said. The next morning at breakfast, my mom asked me where my tooth went. From what she told me, the tooth fairy didn't find it under my pillow. When I told her that I had given it to Ikbar, she just shrugged and went back to feeding my little sister. From then on, every time I lost a tooth, I would give it to Ick. He would always thank me, of course, and tell me that he loved me. Eventually, though, I ran out of baby teeth, and I was beginning to get a little too old to still be playing with dolls. So, Ick just sat there on my bookshelf collecting dust, slowly fading away from my attention. Over time, the nightmares, however, became worse than ever. So bad that they began to follow me to the waking world, terrorizing every dark corner or rustle in the bushes. After one particularly bad night... <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> After one particularly bad night biking home from a friend's house where I swore a pack of rabid dogs were chasing me, I got home to find something strange waiting for me in my room. There, on my bed, standing fully upright on the soft glow of the moonlight from my window, was Ikbar. At first I just thought my eyes were playing tricks on me again. They had been all evening, so I tried to flick on the lights. Another flick at the light switch, and another, and another, with no change to the darkness. It was then I started to get nervous. I backed away slowly towards the door behind me, my eyes never leaving the shape of Ick's silhouette, my hand awkwardly outstretched behind, reaching for the doorknob. I was just about to get my ass out of there when I heard the door slam itself shut, locking me into the blackness. In nothing but shadows and silence, I stood frozen in place, not even breathing. For how long, I can't say, but after what felt like a lifetime of cold fear, I heard the shrill, familiar voice, you stopped feeding me, so why should I protect you? Protect me from what? Let me show you. I blinked once, and everything changed. I wasn't in my bedroom anymore. I was somewhere else. It wasn't hell, but the comparison wasn't far off. It was some sort of forest, a horrible, nightmarish place where partial embryonic abortions hung from the canopy and the ground swarmed with carnivorous insects. A thick fog wafted through the air and with it the stench of rotting meat, while chartreuse lightnings flashed across the night sky. In the distance I could hear the agonizing screams of something not quite human. My head throbbed like it was about to explode, the pain forcing out a river of tears. In my mind, I heard his voice again. This is what your reality would become without me. I felt earth-shaking footsteps approaching fast. I'm the only one who can stop it. 
It was behind me now, huge and angry, hot breath across my back. Bring me what I need, and I will. I woke up before I could turn around. The following day, I raided my parents' closet for my brother's baby teeth, giving them all to Ikbar. Almost immediately, the night terror ceased, and I was more or less able to go on with my life as normal. From time to time, I would have to sneak into my little sister's room and snatch what was meant for the tooth fairy, or strangle one of the neighborhood cats and pry out its sharp little incisors. Anything to ward off the visions. Anything from a shark tooth necklace to a cavity written by cuspid. I also began to notice that Ick would move about my room whenever I left for any length of time, rearranging my stuff and hanging additional curtains. He was beginning to even look more lifelike somehow. In the right light, his teeth would glisten, and he was warm to the touch. As much as he creeped me out, I couldn't work up the courage to just destroy him, knowing perfectly well where that would leave me. So I went on collecting teeth for Ick throughout all of high school and college. The older I got, the more things I would learn to fear, and the more teeth Ick would need to keep me safe. I'm 22 years old now, with a decent job, my own apartment, and a set of dentures. It's been almost a month since Ick's last meal and the horrors are starting to crowd around me once more. I took a detour through a parking garage after work tonight. I found a man fumbling for his car keys. His teeth were stained yellow from a lifetime of cigarettes and coffee. Even still, I had to use a hammer to get out the molars. When I got back to my apartment, he was waiting for me. On the ceiling, in the corner. Two white eyes and the mouth of razors. How much do you love me? He asks. More than anything, I reply, taking off my coat. More than anything in the world. Oh, fuck. That is horrifying. <laughs> and this was a uh, credit to uh, Stefan or Stephen D. Harris for this one. Hot damn. Yeah, no, that's good. Mm hmm. That's hot damn. I, I have loved that story for a very long time. There's another one that I, I remember. I can't again. I can't remember the name of it, but it, this one was also really good. Um, I remember vaguely that I think it was like about a young man with, um, and he lives just with his dad, uh, and his dad's always been his like savior and his guardian and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and very similar here, where like uh, his dad would like come into the room and like scare away all the monsters you know he thought it was just his hallucinations as a kid right or his like nightmares as a kid mm -hmm. um but then at the end uh it's you know years pass father passes away mm -hmm. but he's he's still like a young man and the things that were trying to get him come back and try to you know try to grab him but mm -hmm. then a other thing this tall, broad, like muscular uh, apparition appears, mm -hmm. and it fights off the the monsters trying to get him. And I think it ends something with along the along the lines of, you know, wherever my dad is, I know he'll always protect me. And I thought that was like, it was just Aww. one of the like, like like it was it was very wholesome and like in it and how it ended too because it's just like unsettling his dad but is, sweet. Like, yeah, very sweet, like a guardian angel type thing. It was really, it was really nice. Mm, I like that. Yeah, I'll see if I can find it, and I'll and I'll share it with you. Yeah. But for the time being, I'm gonna go ahead and read uh, the Tulpa. Let's see. All right. Last year, I spent six months participating in what I was told was a psychological experiment. I found an ad in my local paper looking for imaginative people looking to make good money. And since it was the only ad that week that I was remotely qualified for, I gave them a call and we arranged an interview. They told me that all I would have to do is stay in a room, alone, with sensors attached to my head to read my brain activity. And while I was there, I would visualize a double of myself. They called it my tulpa. Seemed easy enough, and I agreed to do it as soon as they told me how much I would be paid. And the next day, I began. They brought me to a simple room and gave me a bed. 
then attach the sensors to my head and hook them into a little black box on the table beside me. They talked me through the process of visualizing my double leg and explained that if I got bored or restless, instead of moving around, I should visualize my double moving around or trying to interact with them and so on. The idea was to keep him with me the entire time I was in the room. I had trouble with it for the first few days. It was more controlled than any sort of daydreaming I'd done before. I'd imagine my double for a few minutes, then grow distracted. But by the fourth day, I could manage to keep him present for an, the entire six hours. They told me I was doing very well. The second week, they gave me a different room with wall-mounted speakers. They told me they wanted to see if I could still keep the tulpa with me in spite of distracting stimuli. The music was discordant, ugly, and unsettling, and it made the process a little more difficult, but I managed nonetheless. The next week, they played even more unsettling music, punctuated with shrieks, feedback loops, which sounded like an old-school modem dialing up, and guttural voices speaking some foreign language. I just laughed it off. I was a pro by then. After about a month, I started to get bored. To liven things up, I started interacting with my doppelganger. We'd have conversations, play rock, paper, scissors, or I imagine him juggling or breakdancing or whatever caught my... I asked the researchers if my foolishness would adversely affect their study, but they encouraged So we played and communicated, and that was fun for a while. Then it got a little strange. I was telling him about my first date one day, and he corrected me. He said my date was wearing a yellow top. He told me it was a green one. I thought about it for a second, and realized he was right. It creeped me out, and after my shift that day, I talked to the researchers about it. You're using the thought form to access your subconscious, they explained. You knew on some level that you were wrong, and then you subconsciously corrected yourself. What had been creepy was suddenly cool. I was talking to my subconscious. It took some practice, and I found that I could question my tulpa and access all sorts of memories. I could make it quote whole pages of books I'd read once, years before, or things I was taught and immediately forgot in high school. It was awesome. It was around the time I started calling up my double outside of the research center. Not often at first, but I was so used to imagining him by now that it seemed almost odd not to see him. So whenever I was bored, I'd visualize my double. I eventually started doing it almost all the time. It was amusing to take him along like an invisible friend. I imagined him when I was hanging out with friends or visiting my mom. I even brought him along on a date once. I didn't need to speak aloud to him, so I was able to carry out conversations with him, and no one was the wiser. I know that sounds strange, but it was fun. Not only was he a walking repository of everything I knew and everything I had forgotten, but he seemed he also seemed more in touch with me than I did at times. He had an uncanny grasp of the minutia of body language that I didn't even realize I was picking up on. For example, I thought the day I brought I brought him along on was going badly, but he pointed out how she was laughing at a little too hard at my jokes and leaning towards me as I spoke, and a bunch of other subtle clues I wasn't consciously picking up on. I listened, and let's just say that that date went very well. By the time I had been at the research center for four months, he was with me constantly. The researchers approached me one day after my shift and asked me if I had stopped visualizing it. I denied it, and they seemed... I suddenly asked my double if he knew what prompted that, but he just shrugged it off. So did I. I withdrew a little from the world at that point. I was having trouble relating to people. It seemed to me that they were so confused and unsure of themselves, while I had a manifestation of myself to confer with. It made socializing awkward. Nobody else seemed aware of the reasons behind their actions why some things made them mad and other things made them laugh. They didn't know what moved them, but I at least I could ask myself and get an answer. A friend confronted me one evening. 
He pounded at the door until I answered it, and came in fuming and swearing up a storm. You haven't answered when I called you in a fucking... in fucking weeks, you dick, he yelled. What's your fucking problem? I was about to apologize to him, and probably would have offered to hit the bars with him that night, but my tulpa grew suddenly furious. Hit him, he said. And before I knew what I, what I was doing, I had. There's no he fell to the floor, came up swinging, and we beat each other up and down the apartment. I was more furious than I had ever been. I was not merciful. I knocked him to the ground and gave him two savage kicks to the ribs. And that was when he fled, hunched over, sobbing. The police were by a few minutes later, and I told them that he had been the instigator, and since he wasn't around to refute me, they let me off with Tulpa was grinning the entire time. We spent the night crowned, crowing, uh, crowing, crowing about my victory. Yeah, crowing about my victory and sneering over how badly I'd beaten my friend. It wasn't until the next morning, when I was checking out my black eye and cut lip in the mirror, that I remembered what had set me off. My double was the one who had grown furious. Not, I'd been feeling guilty and a little shamed, but he goaded me into a vicious fight with a concerned friend. He was present, of course, and knew my thoughts. You don't need him anymore. You don't need anyone else, he told me, and I felt my skin crawl. I explained this all to the researchers who employed me, but they just laughed it off. Uh, you can't be scared of something that you're imagining, one told me. My double stood beside, me, stood beside him and nodded his head and then smirked at me. I tried to take their words to heart, but over the next few days, I found myself growing more and more anxious around my tulpa, and it seemed that he was... He looked taller and more menacing. His eyes twinkled with mischief, and I saw malice in his constant smile. No job was worth losing my mind over, I decided. If he was out of control, I'd put him down. I was so used to him at that point that visualizing him was an automatic process, so I, so I started trying my damnedest not to visualize him. It took a few days, but it started to work somewhat. I could get rid of him for hours at a time, but every time he came back, he seemed worse. His skin, his skin seemed to ashen, his teeth more pointed. He hissed and gibbered and threatened and swore. The discordant music I'd been listening to for months seemed to accompany him everywhere. Even when I was at home, I'd relax and slip up, no longer concentrating on not seeing him. And there he'd be, and that howling noise with him. I was still visiting the research center and spending my six hours there. I needed the money, and I thought they weren't aware that I was now actively not visualizing my tulpa. I was wrong. After my shift one day, about five and a half months in, two impressively... There's a typo I'm assuming, there. Well, two, yeah, two impressive two men. Impressive, two impressive men grabbed and restrained me. Someone in a lab coat jabbed a hypodermic needle into me. I woke up from my stupor back in the room strapped into the bed, music blaring with my doppelganger standing over me, cackling. He hardly looked human anymore. His features were twisted, his eyes were sunken in their sockets and filmed over like a corpse's. He was much taller, but hunched over, his hands were twisted, fingernails were like talons. He was short, fucking terrifying. I tried to will him away, but I couldn't seem to concentrate. He giggled and tapped the IV in my arm. I thrashed my restraints as best as I could, hardly move at all. There, you full of shit thing. That's how's the mind. All fuzzy. He leaned closer and closer as he spoke. I gagged. His breath smelled like raw, spoiled meat. I tried to focus, but couldn't banish him. The next few weeks were terrible. Every so often, someone in a doctor's coat would come in and inject me with something or force feed me a pill. They kept me dizzy and unfocused, and sometimes left hallucinating or delusional. My thought form was still present, constantly mocking. He interacted, or perhaps caused my delusions. I hallucinated that my mother was there, scolding me, and then he cut her throat and her blood showered me. It was so real that I tasted. it. The doctors never spoke to me. I begged at times, screamed, hurled invectives, and demanded answers. Never spoke to me. 
they may have talked to Boba, my the monster. I'm not sure. I was so doped and confused that it may have just been more delusion. But I remember them talking with him. I grew convinced that he was the real one, and I was the thought form. He encouraged that line of thought at times, mocked me at others. Another thing that I pray... Oh, another thing that I pray was a delusion. Touch me. More than that, he could hurt me. He'd poke and prod at me. Bit, oh, what's up? You are cutting out just a little bit. Just a little bit, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, all right. Another there thing... You. Yeah, another thing that I pray was a delusion. He could touch me. More than that, he could hurt me. He'd poke and prod at me if he felt I wasn't paying enough attention to him. Once, he grabbed my testicles and squeezed until I told him I loved him. Another time, he slashed my forearm with one of his talons. I still have a scar. Most days, I can convince myself that I injured myself and just hallucinated that he was responsible. Most days. Then, one day, while he was telling me a story about how he was going to gut everyone I loved, starting with my sister, he paused. A querulous look crossed his face and reached out and touched my head, like my mother used to when I was feverish. He stayed still for a long moment and then smiled. All thoughts are created, he told me, and then he walked out the door. Three hours later, I was given an injection and passed out. I awoke unrestrained, shaking. I made my way to the door and found it unlocked. I walked out into the empty hallway and then ran. I stumbled more than once, but I made it down the stairs and out into the lot behind the building. There, I collapsed, weeping like a child. I knew I had to keep moving, but I couldn't manage it. I got home eventually. I don't remember how. I locked the door and shoved a dresser against it. Took a long shower and slept for a day and a half. Nobody came for me in the night. And nobody came the next day. Or the one after that. It was over. I'd spent a week locked in that room. But it felt like a century. I'd withdrawn so much from my life beforehand that nobody had known that I was missing. The police didn't find anything. The research center was empty when they searched it. The paper trail fell apart. The names I'd given were aliases. Even the money I'd received was apparently untraceable. I recovered as much as I can. I don't leave the house much, and I have panic attacks when I do. I cry a lot. I don't sleep much. And my nightmares are terrible. It's over. I tell myself. I survived. I use the concentration those bastards taught me to convince myself. It works. Sometimes. Not today, though. Three days ago, I got a phone call from my mother. There's been a tragedy. My sister's the latest victim in a spree of killings, the police say. The perpetrator mugs his victims, then guts them. The funeral was this afternoon. It was as lovely a service as a funeral can be, I suppose. I was a little distracted, though. All I could hear was music coming from somewhere distant. Discordant, unsettling stuff that sounds like feedback and shrieking and a modem dialing up. I hear it still a little louder now. Oh. <laughs> oh. That is good. That's good. I thought you might like that. Oh. That concept I, of almost like manifesting your own doppelganger. Yeah, that kind of gives me like the whole thing of like uh, the ego, the shadow, uh, the mm -hmm. the id and the super ego and all that kind of stuff. That mm -hmm. is, oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's good. I like that. I thought you might get a kick out of that, so I was like, I, I have to, at the very least, I need to introduce you to this story if you haven't read it before. I have not, no, and it's good. I like it a lot. I am so That's... glad. Also, hello, Drafty. Hello, Drac. I hope you had yourself a good Halloween. If you're plastered, I have to assume you had a good one so far. <laughs> hey, yep, yeah, that sounds like a good Halloween. 
All right, Grimlock uh, says that like... uh, they've finished uh, their story. Yeah. It's less than a thousand words. Yeah, uh, so we can uh, we can do that one next if you want to start that one off. Sure. Let's see. Well, Drafty, I figure you had to go back to work, but Drac is currently plastered. Hey. <laughs> You've been pinned, pinned by your cats. I'm so sorry. Tell Pickles I say hello. This is a stream Pickles can watch. Hey. Off Bye to bed, Sasha. Way. No worries. Good you night, have a good Sasha. night. And Sully, you too. Take care. You have a good night. Where's it? So plastered a four pound cat is unliftable. That doesn't sound like too too <laughs> bad of a problem though. <laughs> Aw, Pickles was the horse for the headless horseman. Oh, that's so cute. I love that. Aww. So uh Sin. We are reading a mixture of creepy pastas from our from creepypasta dot com, uh, and from the fandom wiki. Uh, we are also reading some r slash no sleep. Uh, we also shared a couple of personal scary stories, and also read a couple of pieces from uh, scary stories to tell in the dark. Any was a witch, Tilly was a mermaid. Oh, that's adorable! I love that. So, Tulpa, that last one that you read, that one was from. That one you can find on r slash no sleep as well as uh, creepypasta.com. That one was from, fuck, like 2016, I think? Uh, something like that, yeah, a while ago. Mm -hmm. Most of my favorite creepypastas are from like... A while. Eight to ten years ago. <laughs> yeah. Again, that's, that's like the height of like... Like we were talking about before, the, that's the height of these stories because... While there are plenty of creative writers like nowadays on like making scary stories on the internet, some of them just don't hit the same. They just don't. Mm -hmm. I think it's like the the problem is that like a lot of the stories that we got during that era, a lot of them were the first time getting a story like that. Whereas exactly. um a lot of stuff we get nowadays is like an homage to uh what we've seen. Like the like the cursed like internet game cartridge and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like getting into like Lavender Town experience and all that stuff. Yeah, or like creepy uh you know, cryptid coming out hunting you, or like malicious mm -hmm. spirit doing X, Y, or Z thing, like you know, um some variant of Slenderman no... or Jake the Killer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh hi Zach, how you doing? How's it going, Zach? Alright, so I got Broggy's story opened up on my end. Okay. Uh... Oh yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's right. He said it is, it is less than a thousand words. Yeah, cool. I figured it was going to be pretty short, so. Yeah. Um... Do you have it pulled up on your end? And how do you want to split this one? Uh, where where was it posted? I didn't. I wasn't informed as to where it was posted. I didn't know if he DM'd it to you or if it was thrown in your narration section or something. Oh, my bad. Ah, it is, I got it. Uh, it is I see in it. the narration the request. E, I see it. I see it. I'm, I'm oh, dumb. I was in. like, I don't know where it is and I don't know where to look. <laughs> yeah, no, my bad. That's okay. All right, uh, yeah, so we can choose um, kind of like whatever works best, I guess. Uh, uh, do we want to do it like rotate uh, between paragraphs or something or? Yeah, let's do that. Good. Sorry, I also just had a friend message me real quick uh, about something that I'm gonna have to get back to him about in a minute. Um, hey. Cause I'm getting a tattoo tomorrow. Oh, hell yeah, that's awesome. E. Look forward what you to getting a tattoo of? 
Uh, I am getting well. First, I'm getting my my um, shoulder piece touched up, but I am Ooh, also nice. uh, getting an inner arm or inner wrist uh, tattoo uh, from the game Neo Twoey. Ooh, nice! Hell yeah! Doing good. Just been busy. I get that, Crimson. Yeah, I totally get that. Oh, I know you were busy. Did you have a good night, oh, Crimson? <laughs> Look, I gotta take every opportunity I can to bully my bestie. That is a good point. Yeah, that's that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> shut, shut, shut. <laughs> Never. That's great. Oh, all right. So, uh, I'll read the stuff that's italicized, and then you can take the first paragraph. Sounds good to me. Oh, Grimlock! Uh, the fact that you even finished this in the time that we've been doing this is is honestly pretty awesome. So it's all good. Yeah, don't worry about it, man. Yeah, never apologize. It's all good. You still put in creative effort. Mm-hmm. Also, the new Vampire Survivors DLC is good. Hell yeah. Nice. Oh, because it's the Castlevania one. Nice. Banana. <laughs> all right, so. Deal with the devil, as written by our darling Grimlock Bragi. The reason deals with the devil were so feared was due to the price paid. To sell one soul was an old concept, a familiar one. If wa It was one many took for granted, and so accepted far too easily. Too many fell into the pitfall of believing that the instant gratification was worth a punishment too far away to truly understand. Too many believed they could trick the devil. Too many did not realize he had invented the game. Ryan took a trembling sip of the drink provided to as he stared at the man sitting across the table. The man was silent, leaning back against the plush couch he sat upon, reading through the packet in his hand. Lights built into the ceiling bathed the room in a deep crimson light, yet the man's blood-red irises stood out still. Ryan did not know what the colors of anything in the room were supposed to be, the light reaching deeply enough that everything was shades of red. The man with the blood-red eyes lifted one hand and wordlessly flipped another page in the packet. His face was blank, and Ryan did not know whether that was good or bad. The silence was horrible, but he hated hearing that man's voice, so he did not dare invoke conversation. The devil's name was John, and he was a man far too easy to find. The king of far too much the puppeteer behind too many powerful people. He was the face of fear and dark and dread. But despite all that power, Ryan had needed only to make mention that he wanted a conversation with John, and he had it. Far too soon, Ryan was in front of the devil, but thankfully not so soon that he was not ready. He knew the deal he wanted to make, and he learned that of all the prices that it had been paid, he did not suffer so long in law school to not know how to write an appropriately thorough contract. He needed the devil only to sign his agreement. Uh, I'm going to read this sentence and also the next paragraph, just because it is a single sentence. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Another page was flipped, and Ryan could tell that John was on the last page. He took another sip of his drink... The devil surprisingly provided water. He had wanted he had wanted much, but he had taken careful measure to phrase it as it, though it was little. His prayer was that making his desire seem insignificant would make him appear boring to John, but just in case that failed, he spent weeks writing out stipulations preventing John from taking advantage of every loophole he could think of. He sought immortality, so he asked the devil to allow him to remain in perfect mental and physical health until his body gave out. In theory, the contradiction would render him immortal. If he remained in perfect health until his body gave out, then his body could not give out due to being too healthy. Blood red eyes lifted oh. from the page to meet Ryan's gaze, and he tensed, straightening in his seat. Amusement danced in the pools, and it made Ryan's tighten his grip on his glass. Very well put together contract, Mr. Pretter. If only more had put 
as much thought into these deals as yourself. Oh, how he hated the devil's voice. Every word was perfect, and absent of inflection. Language from before there was language. Packet was lowered onto the table between the two of them, and was picked up. Except. The scritched scratch of the signature being signed was, for a moment, the only sound of the room, before John slid the paper around and pushed it out toward Ryan. Setting his glass of water down on the table, he shakily took the signed contract in his hand, holding it with reverence. That's it? Yes, hopefully. The devil reclined in his seat once more. As per the contract, since your signature is already present, your verbal information will enforce the agreement. A wide, relieved smile spread across Ryan's face. Then I accept. No sooner than once the last syllable left his mouth did a deep and echoing pain rip through him, bringing the man to scream in agony. The contract fell from his hands as he fell to the floor, curling in on himself in a desperate attempt to escape the pain. What did you do? He screamed up at the devil, who looked down at his most recent victim passively. You, you saw, saw a body that would remain in perfect mental and physical health until your body gave out. I had to pull the energy to adhere to that from somewhere. Pain burned so hotly that his fingers' hips began to grow numb and cold, the icy feeling slowly spreading up his limbs toward his heart. What did you do? Blood red eyes danced with sadistic amusement. In order to give you an immortal body, I used all the energy of your immortal soul. The devil leaned forward to pick up his own glass, a cup of ancient scotch, and returned to his relaxed position. The contract never asked how I would accomplish my end of the agreement. A sick smile spread across red-lit cheeks. There is little better entertainment to me than those who think they can outsmart the devil. As Ryan's vision darkened and faded, the last thing he saw were bemute. It's a blood. Ooh. That was fun. I like that. Yeah, I like that too. That was good. Also, uh, I got a uh, heads up that we've got an incoming ad break happening in about four minutes. I'm probably just going to snooze it until, because I figure we're probably going to raid out in a minute here, yeah? Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually what I was about to do, or what I just did right now. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and right, wrap it up huge. here. Yeah, uh, I, up, straight up, you want to know what I thought, where I thought that was going to go? Hmm. I had a thought where it's like, when, you, when you're when you of perfect mental and physical health, I mm -hmm. thought he was going to go into a coma. Oh, good point. That was my thought, that he was going to get trapped in his own body, like stuck in a coma where no one knew that his brain was still working and in perfect health. Yeah. Oh, that shit. That was my thought process. I was like... Is he going to, like, go into a fucking coma and, like, not be able to, like, get out of it? Mm-hmm. Damn. That was my Good. thought process. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Also, the uh, Autobot logo sounds cool as hell, Zach. Hey. Nice. That's awesome. I'm looking at who we can raid into, and I have someone in mind. Um, Does he have the name? Uh, yeah, it is, it is my buddy, uh, Franz, a German spy. He is actually one of the content creators that, like, kind of inspired me to get into content creation. Um, okay. he's, he's a r very eloquent, very knowledgeable guy, uh, very kind and very welcoming. Uh, I, he's not a VTuber, but, uh, like I said, he, I, I rate yeah, he's flesh tubers from time to time. Yeah. Yeah, he's just one of those longtime creators that I've just have had like massive respect for. So, uh, if you want to raid into him, that'd be cool. It's so funny because the moment I looked over at their screen, I just saw this, you know, elf looking chick with red hair. And I was oh. like, I thought you said they weren't a VTuber. And I'm like, oh, it's because they're playing something that's. <laughs> yeah, no, he's playing uh, uh, Metaphor Re Fantasio. Uh, for anybody who knows Atlas, that is their latest 
JRPG that's been released. Okay. All right. Uh, I might actually raid into somebody else if that's okay with you, because uh, I've got my buddy Vin, who's also one of my nearest and dearest mods, uh, who is currently playing through uh, Amanda the Adventurer 2. Ah, gotcha. I didn't yeah, even no know worries. that they'd come up with a second one. I don't think I even know what Amanda the Adventurer is. So Do you hey. not? Ooh, okay. So uh, real quick before we before we raid out, um, mm -hmm. I will I will tell you Amanda the Adventurer is mm -hmm. like what if someone took a creepy pasta about a video game that has like someone's soul trapped in it and turned it into a video uh -huh. game. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Also, uh, Raimondo96, thank you so much for the follow. Grab yourself a pint, have a seat, and join the CMS adventure. Unfortunately, we're closing the door to the quarters today, but uh, our next adventure is not too far away. Yeah. Also, thank you for um, the love, Red, as well as the sippy and the stretch. Oh, all, all the all the bits flying towards your face. <laughs> yeah, just the sheer amount of uh, bits and stuff. It's really funny when uh, people um, send me like the, the sippy command because I just get fucking buffeted with cans of rogue. <laughs> That's great. I love that. But yeah, it, it's essentially, what if Dora the Explorer, but horror? Ah, okay. That does sound really interesting. Yeah. E, really fun. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so, Caleb, when's your next stream? My next stream uh, will be tomorrow night. Uh, I am thinking of playing Dragon Age the Veil Guard, uh, just to kind of see what my opinions on it will, will be. Um, a lot of people have been saying really good things about Veil Guard. So I'm hopeful in checking it out. Nice, nice. And uh, what about you, Raina? What are you doing? Saturday. Uh, I'm doing kind of a delayed, slightly longer celebration of the fact that, holy shit, guess, guys, guess what? I've been streaming for four years. Who let that happen? Woo! Um, yeah, no, wild fucking concept. So uh, I'm going to be, uh, on Saturday, I'm going to be playing some uh, Helldivers 2 with uh, the Candyman and a couple of people. Uh, I'm also going to just, in general, be celebrating, uh, like, just good times uh, all around. I will also be, um, on Sunday, uh, attempting to complete It Takes Two with Captain Fluffs. So we're going to be picking up from our last uh, playthrough. Hell yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and then I'm doing Spicy Heart stuff uh, tomorrow evening and Saturday evening, if you want to tune in for that, uh, where I can promise you, a ga gameplay is attempted, but not guaranteed. Hey, nice. <laughs> as as yesterday was proof, because God, I made no progress. Um, but it was funny as hell. Uh, and then That's I had great. a massive coughing fit. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, but uh, for those of you who oh, also great. love to listen to Caleb and I reading, uh, we do do spicy readings over on the Blue Heart site as well. Uh, he and I are going to be working on when our, we can next schedule that, because I miss you so much. I miss you too. Wee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But yeah, we, uh, we should be getting back to that here soon. Yes, fingers crossed. Uh, but in the meantime, though, thank you so much, everybody that came by the quarters. I hope you had yourself a spooktacular Halloween in All Hallows Eve and Samhain. Uh, I hope you took care of yourselves. Don't gorge yourself on too much candy. You'll get a tummy ache. Other than that, have yourselves a wonderful time zone wherever you're at. Give Caleb a cheeky follow, and I hope to see you next time. And for people on my side, thank you all so much for watching. I greatly appreciate you all. I hope to see you guys all tomorrow night for Dragon Age The Veil Guard. Uh, and we shall go say hi to a German spy or Vinzilla, depending on which raid you're sticking around for. Uh, and again, take care of yourselves, stay safe, all that kinds of good stuff. Buenas noches y hasta Bye. luego. <laughs>